evening and welcome to Good evening and welcome to the August 21st regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. Please join in, in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Councilor Holbrook? Here. Councilor Sullivan? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Blaze? Here. Vice Chair uh, Roy? Here. Council Alquist uh, is not able to be here tonight, nor uh, Council of Benedict. Before we begin the general public comments, I just you know, want to make sure that everybody's clear on that. We spend the first 30 minutes of general comment, and you can comment on, and things that are not on the agenda with the original intent of it, certainly can comment on things that are on the agenda in the general comments. You'll have a second opportunity prior to the Council making a motion on any of the items. Uh, that you're here for tonight, so you'll have a second opportunity each time you get up. It's a three-minute, three-minute period. Um, um, and then, um, <coughs> it's on. Yep. Usually, I can speak loud, loud enough without a microphone. So, um, you want me to start that again? Okay. The general comment time is was originally intended for items that are not on the agenda, because we had people waiting until 10 o'clock at night to speak on issues that weren't on the agenda. However, we also take comments on things that are on the agenda. You do have three minutes. We spend the first 30 minutes of the council meeting on those. If there are more people that would want to speak, I can uh, set some more time towards the end of the meeting. You will, however, be able to make comment prior to the council making a motion on any of the items on the agenda. Uh, for example, tonight's issue on uh, dogs on the beach, this is the first reading, so you'll have also another opportunity at the public hearing at the next meeting. You'll have another opportunity during the general comment prior to the item being moved by the council at the second reading, so there's ample opportunity for you to express your views and concerns. So um, with that, I will um, open it up to uh, general comments. I also will time it, and you hear, you'll hear a little noise, uh, and just know that your three minutes is, is towards the end, and uh, the next person can get up to speak at that point in time. If you're interested in getting up to speak to expedite things, if you would queue up, it would make it a lot easier as well. So with that. Hi, I'm Suzanne Foley-Ferguson, 331 Black Point Road. Um, I'm hoping, I'm speaking about um, a proposed amendment that was uh, proposed by Scarborough Downs but not offered by any town councilor yet. And I'm hoping that it'll never be offered by a, um, a councilor because um, the, the amendment was um, asking the council to simplify a process by which a casino could be built in our community. Um, and I'm sure that you realize that by even considering the amendment, the town council is basically considering letting go of their control of zoning issues should a casino be allowed. But in case the amendment is considered, first I w I'd like to make a couple comments. First of all, zoning changes are meant to be burdensome. Those are the one things in towns that are meant to be burdensome. They aren't meant to be simplified. Um, and that's because they're based on comprehensive plans which are put together with incredible input from the public. Um, secondly, according to state law, Maine revised statutes, and I'll give this to you, um, statutes 4351 Title 30A, uh, 4352 on zoning ordinances, a zoning ordinance must be pursuant to and consistent with a comprehensive plan adopted by municipal. So thus far I haven't heard any discussion about the consistency of the amendment to the comp plan. I know the Long Range Planning Committee uh, make sure that all their proposals to you are consistent. However, that, that particular amendment was never run through the Long Range Planning Committee. It was an offer by the Scarborough Downs people, so there is no discussion by them of uh, whether it's consistent with the comprehensive plan. And I, knowing the comprehensive plan the way I do, uh, I can find numerous inconsistencies. So thirdly, I would say the last time we were inconsistent with the comprehensive plan, we got sued. That was called the Great American Neighborhood, and guess what? They won. So I would be very careful in adopting or considering an amendment that's inconsistent with a comprehensive plan. 
Um, it's the Scarborough Downs that has requested you to consider this. It's not the public that has requested you, and it's not the committees that, that um, have requested you. So um, I'm hoping it'll, it won't even come up, but thank you. Thank you. Larry Bruns, 39 Hanson Road. Um, it's been a few years since I've been here. Uh, but the last time that I was here, the public uh, comment session was at the end of the uh, meeting, and I hope that you will consider possibly doing that again tonight for a while anyways, uh, so that we can address you. We, we will not hear your, your deliberations before we make comments on any of the agenda items that you uh, addressed tonight. So I would appreciate the opportunity, if I have a question, to be able to ask you that tonight once the meeting is over with. or towards the end of the meeting, not after the meeting is over with. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Katie Foley, 3 Lucky Lane, Scarborough, Maine. Um, and I'm using this time, I will speak later when we get to the issues of uh, the uh, amendment to the animal control ordinance, but I have a friend who was out of town. Is this an appropriate time for me to share that letter, or should I just pass this out to the council? Whatever your choice. Okay. If, you if I can't read fast enough, you can cut me off. But she asked, she asked me today if I would read it for her, so I appreciate the time. Um, this letter is to, uh, her name is Julie Hannon, 14 Mast Road, Scarborough, Maine. Uh, this letter is to express my concerns and interest regarding the ordinance and review that impacts canine access to Scarborough Town Beaches. All quotes or citations were taken from the most, most recent review published by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service report published in 2009. Please accept my apologies for not using the MLA citation format. She's a teacher. Um, <laughs> so uh, I want to first thank the council members for the time and attention you are giving to this ordinance, to the status of piping plovers, to the issues facing Audubon birders, to the goals of wildlife conservationists, and to the concerns of Scarborough dog owners, and to the desire for public access by all of Scarborough's citizens. When the incident, the death of a plover chick occurred, I immediately asked questions. Who reported this? Whose dog was this? How did this happen? I wondered, was the person a local resident? Did the person make an effort to control their dog? Was this a general access or a protected area? Were there any notices or warnings that a plover chick was in the area? I read that the owner was sternly reprimanded before the attack, that the chick was mauled, and I wondered how and who. How could this have happened and who allowed this to happen? I later read that there were many misreports of the death of the plover. I read that the dog owner was from Scarborough, that the owner attempted to stop the incident, but that there were no warnings to the dog owner by person or signage, uh, and, that the, that the dog, and that the dog owner violated no ordinance. I'm sincerely troubled that we in this country, when an incident occurs, are more likely to assume guilt rather than innocence, and more likely to change laws rather than enforce them. I suggest that we enforce and fine-tune rather than change an ordinance that has been working well. I suggest that we educate for a better tomorrow rather than punish all canines and dog owners for an innocent and unfortunate mishap. This is a long letter. How long, much time do I have? Yeah, you got a minute. All right, I'll go. Uh, Scarborough is among a large number of seaside main towns that have been generous to visitors, both human and canine. Because of this, we, respectful, we are respectful of this generosity, and we do not take it for granted, and we hope the visitors to, to Maine will do the same. We go to the beach regularly with our two dogs. Uh, one walks ahead and one walks behind, but both are visible and within earshot. If we go to the beach after 5 p.m., it is usually after 7 to enjoy the sunset and not disrupt the beachgoers enjoying a picnic on the beach. Our dogs are kept away from beachgoers, the dunes, and we abide by the signage regarding piping plovers and protected areas. Our dogs do not chase birds. As a matter of fact, we rarely see, rarely see dogs chasing birds, except for the occasional seagull. Dogs instinctually aren't hunters of birds, like cats, coyotes, or birds of prey. They play with each other and people, and they are domesticated. We occasionally see a disrespectful dog owner letting their dog romp on a beachgoer's towel or poop left unscooped. The beach is one of the few places where dogs can run, swim, and socialize with others. Ferry Beach, because of its high dunes, is the only place that our dogs can be off leash. Why do we want to deny our family pets this joyful experience? We would not and have not, and have not denied our children this experience or ourselves for that matter. At Ferry Beach, we don't restrict humans, humans from the piping plover breeding areas, only dogs. We see many more children romping in the dunes than dogs. The dogs are running down the beach to catch a ball, greet fellow dogs and dog owners. They're swimming in the ocean. When we see abuses by dog owners, it is usually a dog we do not recognize with a person who is not a regular beachgoer. We call them out. <laughs> That's basically it. I'll, I'll, I do have a copy. I'll just let you guys distribute that. Mm -hmm. oh, so, 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 Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Hi, Karen DeAndre, Eagles Nest Drive. Um, I'm going to speak to the dog issue because I probably won't be able to stay till the end. Um, and what I'm going to probably say will not make some people hap not very happy. Um, but I think uh, primarily after looking at the proposed changes, I think they make sense. Um, I agree that dogs should be leashed. I might go as far as to say dogs should be leashed all the time unless they're on your property. I have a dog. Um, <clears throat> I'm a dog person. I love dogs. I think that there are plenty of places for dogs to run. Um, I think that um, uh, the increase in dog, po we, we, we've been seeing an increase in the pet population across the board, no matter where you are in the United States, and this includes dogs. Having knocked on 2,000 doors in Scarborough, I can attest to the number of dogs that are in our town. Um, it puts pressure on the community in, in a number of ways. I mean, we certainly have seen it with the uh, piping plovers. Um, we see it with kids on the beach. I've heard recently from some friends who have children who don't appreciate dogs rushing up to their kids. I've heard about elderly folks who are worried that a loose dog is going to come and knock them over. Um, so I think, again, it, this has a lot to do with the pressure on the community and the number of dogs. We saw this happen with cars. Uh, when cars first came online in the United States, we barely had roads. Uh, we didn't have any laws for them, but certainly as the number of cars increased, the pressure on the communities increased as well, so regulation came along. Same kind of thing happens is going to happen with dogs. Um, so I uh, also agree, though, with uh, many people here that I have heard the last time that um, uh, the dogs aren't the only problem that the piping plovers are experiencing. So I think that this is one piece of the protection puzzle, is you know, keeping dogs away. But the other pieces of that protection puzzle need to be things like uh, you know, having a community discussion about loose cats, um, because we know cats take birds all the time in our communities. Um, Fireworks. I was, you know, I've been down on the beach most mornings the last couple of weeks. Two huge boxes of fireworks with, you know, one inch diameter tubes. These were not small fireworks. And guess where they were? Right near where there is currently still a piping plover sign. So we know that there are a lot of problems around protecting the plovers, and the dog piece is just a small part of that. So I hope that this is. Uh, an opportunity for the council to take a much broader approach at looking how to protect the birds. Um, uh, I just, and I just want to also add that there have been, over the past couple of weeks, a number of incidences. I've seen two dogs chasing migrating shorebirds. In one of the flocks of shorebirds, I saw two piping plovers. Um, there could be red knots in there, another endangered species that we will commonly see along our coast. And then I had other things to say about that, but as my final thing, I hope that also taking into account two other things. One is Old Orchard Beach, who has very lax rules about dogs being on the beach at any, at, at any time um, and during their specific time. But, uh, I hope that we look at what Old Orchard Beach is doing. And then one final thing. Um, I've been asked by some elderly folks who walk their dogs that it would the council consider moving the dates, uh, the, or excuse me, the times. And that is uh, the hours went from 9 to 5 starting in June. And in the proposed amendment, it's 9 to 5 starting in April. And a lot of the retired folks, it's too cold really early in the morning in April and May, and they like to sort of wait till the sun really gets up and warms the beach. And so they're really interested in having those times start again in June as, as they have uh, right along. Thank you. Former counselors don't follow rules. <laughs> 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 I tried to make it a gentle reminder. I, I tried. <laughs> uh, Carol Rancourt, 23 Black Point Road, and I also may not be able to stay for the whole meeting, so I wanted to speak on the um, amendment to the uh, um, 
long-range plan to the um, crossroads. crossroads development and speak up in opposition to that uh, amendment. I am very concerned about due process. Um, as you remember, a few years ago, we had a similar um, issue, very similar issue come before us, actually in the month of August, and that resulted in a vote in which um, the plan was defeated. But that gave the, uh, all of the Scarborough residents a chance to speak on this issue. And I think that we need to make sure that um, the issue gets fully aired um, and that we are not, uh, the town council is not ruling by fiat rather than, uh, go I know that democracy can be long and painful and messy, but in the end it is the fair thing to do. The long range planning, or yes it is the long range planning committee now, um, has presented you with its proposals that do not include uh, the word casino or um, racino and I think that is what you should be acting on and forestall amendments until they get a, a full airing to, from all Scarborough, to all Scarborough residents and that you get to hear all their comments. Thank you. Good evening, Eddie Wooden, 34 Clearwater Drive, Scarborough. Thanks to the town council for the opportunity to be here. I'm here to discuss dogs versus piping plovers. Uh, being a nature, uh, <laughs> being a nature and bird lover person, uh, I'm weighing in on the side of the piping plovers, and I commend the council for their courage in once again reviewing this issue as we did many years ago. That was uh, quite entertaining and a great turnout. The piping plover is an endangered species. It's the equivalent of the bald eagle back in the 60s during the DDT, Silent Spring. And you can imagine back then if a dog had mauled a, a young eagle, bald eagle. This is the same concept. There are 3,800 piping plovers on the East Coast. They migrate 1,500 miles into the Carolinas and Florida. And like extinct species, they're very, they're not wary. They're friendly of sorts, uh, a la the, the great auk, the Carolina parakeet, the passenger pigeon. So they really need our respect and our support. In the state of Massachusetts, the Fed shut down, bless you, in the state of Massachusetts, the Fed shut down Plum Island Beach for the entire breeding season, and their success, success rate has increased to 85% from 25%. Uh, and the people support it there. They have no choice, but they support it. Uh, I'm a proponent of April 1 to October 1. Uh, the piping plovers on our first go around when we came up with a September date and then maybe it was May 15 date. Plovers are here early April. They're very hardy. They begin their nesting. And it's a bell-shaped curve where some will nest early, some later. And some of them are not completing until uh, into September. And to uh, Karen's point, um, we then have the migration of shorebirds, approximately 20 species of shorebirds. They're here into October. And the example of dogs chasing uh, birds, dogs are hunters, many of them. And they have that instinct of chasing birds. I've seen piping plovers being chased. It was a horror. Um, so I, I think it's important to consider April 1 to October 1. Um, I'm for the leash, um, at least during that period of time. Winter, fewer birds, um, less risk. You now have the terns if you go to Ferry Beach, the young juveniles. You have the Bonaparte skulls or a lot of young birds, and they should be protected, particularly at low tide out on the flats. Dogs left to run in that area uh, is a problem. Um, if, if I had my druthers, I would create a dog park off Black Point Road in that athletic field, dig a hole so the dogs can swim as well, and ban them from the beach. Uh, I think we should take seriously the federal laws. I'm hoping the town will uh, speak with the district attorney and with the feds and prosecute to the fullest. We had years ago a high school drinking party at Higgins Beach that destroyed so many eggs, chicks, and nests. Nothing was done. It was a $500 fine. It was swept under the rug. 
here we go again, here's a result. If an example had been set then, people would have been more careful. So I applaud you and I support the plovers. Thank you. I'd like to, we have 10 more minutes of the general comment session and then we will move on to the agenda. We'll do it again. I'm Susan Wilder from Three Tide Mill Lane in Scarborough and I'm here to speak for my elderly father who was a dog lover all of his life, dog owner, and he loved going to Ferry Beach but he was always afraid that he would be knocked over uh, while he walked on the sand escorting my mother along. And uh, when I walk my dog on the beach, she's always leashed. That puts her and me at a disadvantage if an unleashed dog approaches me. I see dogs running in the dune grass. I see unleashed dogs after five. And it spoils my time on the beach to have to say something to oblivious owners. I ask that the town require dogs to be leashed at all times on the beach and that we consider taking part of the underused Black Point Park as a dog park. Thank you. Um, my name is Catherine Rogers, 373 Gorham Road. I own the Dog Paws Inn, which is a small daycare and boarding facility on Gorham Road. My business and other businesses in town will be affected if the ordinance is changed as proposed. Every summer I have inquiries from people who are coming from out of state to vacation in Scarborough, specifically because they want to bring their dogs on the beach with them. They want to take their dog to the beach in the morning before, before 9 during off-leash hours and then leave them with me for the rest of the day, paying me to watch their dog when they aren't on the beach with them. They're also paying for lodging in Scarborough, buying souvenirs, paying for activities, um, and they're also the people I'm sure will stay elsewhere and spend their money elsewhere if the proposed ordinance changes are enacted as they, they're read, as they read now. Um, not only will businesses lose money, the town will too. Um, those tourists buy beach stickers and pay for parking. Um, so do local dog owners. I have a beach sticker on my car but not because I go to the beach a lot during the summer, but because I go to the beach with my dog between Memorial Day weekend and June 15th. I go enough that it makes it worth it to buy a sticker just for that short period of time. I can't be the only one who does it, and I also can't be the only one who will stop buying a sticker if you pass the ordinance as proposed. Um, banning all off-leash dogs for six months of the year is an unnecessary overreaction. There's some very practical steps that Scarborough can take and in fact owes its residents to take short of an outright ban. Um, the town should de educate all beachgoers about piping clovers. There should be new signs made and put up that tell about the clovers, that they nest at the beach, show pictures of what they look like, and the rules concerning disturbing them. Um, the signs should be placed at every entrance to the beach and along the dunes. Uh, right now the signage is inadequate but could easily be improved. Um, second, the town should make one small but important change to the current ordinance. That change should require dog owners to leash their dogs and move to another area of the beach when they see a piping clover or when they're told by other beachgoers that there are piping clovers nearby. By implementing those two measures, the town will be fulfilling its responsibility to protect the clovers as well as fulfilling its responsibility to craft ordinances as narrow and as fair as possible for all the citizens of this town. I would ask that whatever the council does, please don't be hasty to make such a radical change to the ordinance governing dogs on the beach. Out of consideration for all the people in town and those from out of town who enjoy taking their dog to the beach to play off leash, Please take the time to look at all the options available short of an outright ban. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. <coughs> uh, my name is Jim Rickle. I live at Six Morning Street, and I'm here <coughs> to talk about dogs. I've written to all of the council members about the proposed leash law. Uh, much to my surprise, three, three people responded. Thank you. 
based on the comments I received, <laughs> it seems that we now have a moving target. And instead of taking action to protect the plovers, the objective is to protect the city and its taxpayers from a fine. <clears throat> a leash law on the books, on the books, I repeat, may exempt the city from consequences of any unpleasant dog plover interaction. In the absence of enforcement, however, and historically, enforcement has been abysmal and has led to many of the problems cited. The birds remain at high risk. Adding more restrictive laws just makes regulations more unenforceable. So I would ask, isn't there some middle ground where dog owners are allowed to legally run their dogs, the city actually protects plovers, and enforcement is facilitated? <clears throat> To that, to that end, I suggest identifying areas of critical plover habitat as, a, as opposed to listing entire beaches. For example, I'm most, most familiar with Higgins, from the west end of Bayview to the east end of Shipwreck. In recent decades, there, has, there have been no plovers, there are no plovers there today, and there will be no plovers in the future because of unsuitable habitat. That leaves less than 25% of the beach to police as crucial habitat for the birds, a sizable re reduction and therefore more enforceable. A similar approach at Pine Point and Ferry Beach, identification of leash-free areas and critical habitat areas would have similar results, easier enforcement and better protection. I would also like to point out that as a group, habitual local dog walkers are some of the better stewards of the beach. Given that, why not recruit them to assist in enforcement through public education, commentary, and example? They are a resource the town should foster, not alienate. They are, they are ever-present, they are willing, and oh, by the way, they're free. So who benefits? The birds benefit, the town benefits, and with identification of leash-free areas, dogs and their owners benefit. Finally, I am compelled to mention Scarborough's own publication on plovers. It states that habitat is severely endangered due to development and, I'm quoting, intense recreational use. If your objective is to actually pursue the intent of the law, plover preservation, then not only must canine restrictions be strictly enforced, but human activity in critical areas must also be severely curtailed. The choice is obviously yours, window dressing or substance. One of the rules is no applauding or moaning or groaning or those kinds of things. This is not a theater, this is a council meeting. So if you could withhold your pause, that we'd appreciate that. Thank you. Good evening, Town Council. I'm Jane Grover. I live on 8 Sargent Road. I've been there for 24 years. Sorry. Jane Grover, uh, 8 Sargent Road. I've been there for 24 years. Um, I'm here tonight to say um, that we have really good laws on the books and that um, I enjoy walking my dog on the beach. I hope you will consider all the issues that other people have said much better than I can tonight, but um, I've read the laws that we have in place and would like to see them enforced. I'd be very happy to help with that as a dog owner. Um, I like the ideas that have been put forth. Um, I'm here just to add my piece to what people are saying. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. We have time for um, one or two more. I'm Paul Austin, 3 Tide Mill Lane. Um, I've been a dog owner my whole life. I've trained and I've shown dogs. Uh, I stopped going to the beach with my dog about 15 years ago because I was so upset with the way people did not manage their dogs. Um, I just think that you need to realize that there are almost no dogs that are reliable with voice commands uh, when, there, when there's excitement, when there are people around. And I think that you need to consider that when you consider your ordinances. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Dick Savizi from Honeywell Road. 
I've lived here since 1976. Uh, I ran a uh, golden retriever on Higgins Beach for 16 years. That's how long he lived by staying in shape that way. It means a lot to me. I also mourn the plover. Uh, I don't agree that one killing of a plover can spoil it for 99%, as the current stated. However, there's a lady that wears a oxygen canister in her hip and walks a dog much more elderly than her. There's another person with a cane that walks an elderly dog. There's a professor from my college who wouldn't get out there and walk for his own health if he wasn't walking an elderly dog. I talk to the uh, attendants at the public parking. They say approximately 50% of all parkers actually bring a dog when they park there. I'm not sure how many are actually Scarborough residents versus non-residents or what their other status is. Um, I now have a little rescue beagle I adopted a year ago, February. I adopted her because I was inspired by a lady that lives at Piper Shores who has an Air Force retired husband like I was an Air Force officer. He's quite elderly. I haven't even met him. But I was inspired that she was able to bring her charcoal lab there, and that's one of the reasons I adopted a dog again. I missed that. I had an incident in 06, which was like a stroke. I lost my balance. There was a lot of other things I couldn't do. Walking my dog and getting on the beach and doing some activities and controlling her is important to me and important to my health. I see this in so many people down there. I haven't seen any problems. I haven't seen the necessity of the police department going down there and enforcing anything. More often than not, children and other families that don't happen to have their dogs with them or don't have a dog enjoy the company and enjoy petting the dogs, giving them treats. I actually said to a woman the other day, Maybe you won't be able to give my dog Daisy treats anymore because she doesn't get enough exercise. I don't know where I'm going to take her to get that kind of exercise. I miss not being there tonight because I usually go there twice a day, early in the morning and at night while the weather's good. We don't have that many good weathered months. And we've talked a lot about this with people from Higgins Beach. I'm not quite so sure they've done that at the other beaches. But we think it's an educational aspect. We need to cordon off an area of the beaches so the plovers can be there. I agree completely with Eddie Wooden, an old friend of mine. But I think there's room for people, their dogs, exercise, and the plovers at the beaches. And uh, we think we ought to have some kind of study group, like you do committees for so many different ordinance issues. We think we ought to have dog owners, non-dog owners, at least one member of the council on the committee so we can study this further. I don't think it should be done irrationally or so quickly that we end up with something that takes away further from our community. This community has changed so much since I moved here to raise my daughters in 1976 that we keep losing activities. We keep losing open land. I'll probably take my little beagle to the golf courses because I know and have played all the golf courses. Most people don't have that opportunity. Most people don't own 40 acres plus out in North or West Scarborough somewhere where they can do that. They just won't get the exercise. Their dogs won't, and they won't enjoy the community the way we used to be able to. Thank you. Thank you. Um. I'm going to close the public hearing at this point, but we will be back to this very shortly. We have a few items on the agenda that we need to deal with, and then we will be back to it. Hmm? Um, we have the minutes of the July 17th and the July 31st meeting, because I have a motion from the council. Move approval. Second. Any errors, omissions, corrections? Hearing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Adjustments to the agenda? Are there any adjustments anybody would like to make to the agenda? No? Items to be signed, there are treasurer's warrants, and I will sign those as the meeting progresses. Resolution 1305 is a resolution to recognize National Public Lands Day. 
Council Hobart. <clears throat> Resolution 1305 in recognition of the 20th anniversary of the National Public Land Day. Be it resolved by the Town Council of the Town of Scarborough, Maine in Town Council assembled that whereas America's system of public lands includes parks, unique landscapes, forests, wildlife refuges, historic trails, natural streams and wetlands, nature centers, community gardens, and other landmarks throughout the nation that individually and collectively represent our shared irreplaceable national resources. And whereas public lands prove locally accessible nature and cultural resources for environmental learning, wildlife appreciation, and recreation. And whereas public lands promote civic ideals that include shared stewardship and recognition of public ownership, and whereas shared stewardship requires the goodwill, cooperation, and active support of citizens, community, local and state officials, business leaders, youth, and adults, and whereas recreation opportunities of offered by public lands help families and individuals lead an active lifestyle and reduce the incidence of childhood obesity, and whereas land conservation efforts improve access to public lands for urban residents and work to break down the barriers that prevent Americans from actively utilizing their public land, and whereas a collaboration among state and local residents, land managers, and community leaders improves the condition of publicly held lands for the greater enjoyment and enrichment of all Americans, and whereas National Public Lands Day, now celebrating its 20th anniversary, is the nation's largest single day volunteer effort for public lands and is coordinated by the National Environmental Education Foundation the Bureau of Land Management, Department of Defense, Environmental Protection Agency, National Park Service, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, and U.S. Forest Service serve as federal agency partners. This effort has become an annually anticipated celebration for local participation on publicly held lands in Scarborough. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Scarborough Town Council and Town Council Assembled that the Town of Scarborough does hereby proclaim Saturday, September 28, 2013, as the 20th anniversary of National Public Lands Day, and call upon the people of Scarborough to recognize and participate in this special observance. Signed and dated this 21st day of August 2013 on behalf of the Scarborough Town Council and the Town Manager of Scarborough, Maine. And that's in the form of a motion? Yes. Any comments? Mm -hmm. I, 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 the one comment I would make, I think we need to all read this verbiage again in light of the situation that we just had input on. So mm -hmm. I think it's, a, it's appropriate, certainly, and public lands are important to, to all. All our families, and dogs sometimes are our families. So, um, all those in favor? Thank you. Under Old Business Order Number 1342 is a second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, to establish a new zoning district specific to the Scarborough Downs property entitled the Crossroads Planning Planned Development District. This item was tabled from the July 17th Town Council meeting. Dan Bacon is going to give us an overview. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Dan Bacon, Town Planner. Um, as I understand it, at your last meeting in July, the uh, council tabled this item, um, given at that time both representatives of the Downs and uh, town councilors were interesting and interested in further discussing um, a different language uh, in the zoning district that could include gaming or casino gambling as a permitted use. It's part of a harness racing facility, um, but also only after Local, local voter approval through a referendum process, uh, amendments to state law, as well as local and state licensing that would include revenue sharing. So given that request by the Downs and, and direction by um, the town manager and council, staff has worked with the town attorney um, over the past month or so and has crafted such amended language um, for your discussion um, this evening. Uh, this language has also been reviewed by the Downs attorney and they've um, found it to be acceptable. Um, so that language I think is provided to, to the council. Um, it's for clarity, it's dated revised August 8th. Um, and like I indicated, it uh, does list uh, casino uh, or slot machine facilities, which is how it's defined under state law. 
as a permitted use, but then goes on to say it's only a permitted use if it's approved through um, the municipal referendum process at a later time um, as being allowed in the town of Scarborough and is also only can take effect after amendments to state law. Right now state law does not allow um, such a facility at uh, the Downs and would only be allowed if there's licensing in place um, both at the state level and the local level which um, like I said would include a revenue sharing agreement. Um, so other than that uh, item I think the uh, the rest of the district um, is is as it's been a pro proposed since first reading. Um, and I guess as a final comment, I would uh, urge the councils part of your discussions to consider whether you consider this a substantial change to the district or alteration to the district. Because um, under the zoning ordinance, if the council contemplates changes that are substantive or significant um, since first reading, um, there's an expectation that it be referred to the planning board for comment and public hearing before you take final action. So um, as your discussion um, begins or ensues, um, give some thought to that requirement by the zoning ordinance. So um, other than that, those are my introductory comments. Um, I don't know if... Dan, could you address the um, comprehensive plan as it relates to any potential amendments? The comprehensive plan, um, in as it talks about the Crossroads District, which is the district's as proposed in the Downs property, um, really doesn't get, in reading the outline of the comprehensive plan, get fine-grained enough to say casinos are allowed or not allowed. Um, there are general use categories, such as office, uh, development, professional offices, and retail. Um, the category that most closely relates to gambling would be uh, places of assembly and entertainment. Um, and in our zoning ordinance, and the comprehensive plan has more general development standards, use allowances, and then in your zoning ordinance, um, the zoning ordinance gets a lot more specific with definitions and more specific uses. Um, so the comprehensive plan basically says places of assembly and amusement uh, or entertainment, rather, are appropriate. Um, in the zoning ordinance um, right now, the B2 zone that applies to the Downs says places of assembly um, and entertainment, and then it goes on to say exclusive of casino gambling, slot machines, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that's a matter of how the council feels about what the comprehensive plan is saying in the Crossroads District. Um, but again, it doesn't speak to casinos and gaming or gambling as an allowed or a prohibited use. It, it um, is more general in terms of the category, the, the use category. Can I ask a yes. I, if, I, if I may, I guess I just had a thought. Um, so the current gaming and gambling that's happening now, would that be considered under whichever, the old one or the new one as it's proposed? The gambling that's taking place now, would that be an allowed use then or a disallowed use? Harness racing and gambling on, on harness racing um, under what's proposed here in the Crossroads District would also be allowed and would continue to be allowed. It's um, <coughs> additional casino gambling and slot machines that aren't related to, to harness racing is what's um, before you for potential amendment. And the, the, the main motion when it's read is relates to, does not include anything that uh, relates to, gamb to casino, correct? Right. What was passed at first reading does not include allowing casino or um, slot machine facilities um, in the district. The major, the major components of the changes are relative to other things that are permitted within it that make it different than a B2 
or B3, which it was a combination of B2 and B3, was it not? It's, it's all B2 today. Okay, so um, all B2. And so the for the rest of the Crossroads District um, basically broadens the uses allowed um, over the B2. Right now the B2 uh, zone is a commercial zone. It doesn't allow residential or mixed-use development. So the Long Range Planning Committee did a lot of work on making it a broader zoning district given the size of the property, how it abuts a variety of different parts of town given its size and the fact that um, it's probably suitable for a mix of some commercial, some residential, some mixed use um, and is of size to be well planned to, to make that happen. And during the Long Range Planning Committee de deliberations on this whole crosswords, crossroads uh, district, uh, there was discussion of casinos. There was. The, the Downs participated a lot in the committee meetings um, and at the public meetings that were held and there was discussion about adding similar language to what's um, been provided to the council this evening back in the spring and the, the committee at that time um, wasn't comfortable with making that step as an advisory committee to the council and felt that was a uh, discussion the council should have if the Downs wanted to have that with the council um, and not their recommendation. Other questions of Dan Bacon before I uh, before we open it to no other questions here. Okay. Okay, so now is the time for public comment. So is there any public comment um, on the the basic crossroads district which expands the available usage of the land for um, other things that are not included in B2? So I'll open the public comment again, three minutes. State your name and address. I'll use my little timer again. Thank you. Jacqueline Perry, 215 Black Point Road. Uh, I am speaking in favor of, of the ordinance, or the change, I should say. Uh, I think that this is a business that we want to keep in town. It is a business that has been very generous with our school district and with our charities. I have personal knowledge that any time Kiwanis has asked for anything. Uh, they have participated with us for Project Grace, for the backpack program, for food uh, collections. Uh, they've offered their facility for meetings, uh, for gatherings at no charge ever. And uh, I am a proponent of, of supporting businesses. The more businesses we have, the better our tax structure is. And, and uh, I supported their gambling efforts because I wanted to see that money go right to our schools. Uh, we certainly could use a bigger tax base. So I am in favor of keeping this business in town and helping them prosper. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, thank you, Councilor Roy. My name is Ed McCall. I live at 78 Wells Road in Cape Elizabeth. I've been the lawyer for the for the Downs since uh, 1989. I just wanted to address a couple of the points that were made earlier uh, by Councilor Ra former Councilor Rancourt and former Councilor Foley Ferguson with respect to concerns about the process here. As Dan outlined, this issue was discussed at length with the Long Range Planning Committee and also before the Planning Board. Our understanding in, before both of those boards were that they expected the issue to be presented to the Council and they thought it was an issue that the Council would, would and could decide. If there's any question about whether additional process is needed, then we're all for additional process. Um, but the language that Dan and the Town's Attorney have come up with as the final draft, of course, would require extensive additional process 
if the ordinance passed as amended, the additional process would be a townwide referendum, which no other use by any other proponent of any other uh, zoning proposal has to go through. We've always said there, would, there should have to be another referendum before this would even be uh, considered in town, uh, and we agree with that. That's still our view. And then the other thing that the zoning ordinance would require at the town level would be additional council involvement, not just to, to approve the use as finally proposed, but also a revenue uh, sharing agreement, which once again, no other use has to have other than a potential gaming use. In talking to the town's attorney, he and I agreed that, that these, would be, these would be beyond what the town could do in zoning laws, except that they're contemplated by the state statute that would need to be amended to extend the deadline to allow this at the downs if it's proposed. So we think the process has been a lengthy process so far. If additional process is needed at this stage, we're pleased to have it. Pleased to have the town involvement. We're pleased to have the involvement from former Councilor Rancourt uh, and former Councilor Foley Ferguson. Uh, they, they've always let uh, their views be heard. They've always spoken eloquently on whichever side they're on. Um, this is, in the long run, something that the Downs is going to have to have in order to survive. Uh, a harness racetrack in a state that has casinos. Uh, can only hang on for so long competing against those other uses before it will be put out of business uh, by that competition. Th that's the unfortunate circumstance that Mrs. Terry finds herself in trying to save a family business and an industry, uh, and she's doing the best she can. Thank you very much for your time this evening. I know you have a busy evening, and I'll try to keep it brief. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sue Foley Ferguson, 331 Black Point Road. Um, education is too important to fund through gambling funds, so don't um, don't buy the easy money routine. The drive-in is also failing. Should we allow slot machines at the drive-in? As a matter of fact, they could survive if we allowed each car to have a slot machine. Probably. I think the amendment, if if the council puts it forward, is putting the cart before the horse. And I know that's just an expression, but literally the town has voted five times on referendum about gambling. I know the last one was very close, and the, you, it always changes. People change their opinions, and it could vote. But nothing in this ordinance right now prevents the downs from going to referendum right now. You don't need to add an amendment. When I say the town has voted five times, they have. If you look at the statistics, in this town we voted against the Oxford Casino, against the Bangor Casino, against um, Bitterford, and against two local ones. So it's not just been twice. Um, I say cart before the horse because I'm asking you not to relinquish your control as a town councilor. You're here to represent the citizens that elected you. I know that includes some businesses, but it, you aren't here to represent every single business as a single business or an industry. Otherwise, we would be saving the, the Scarborough Drive-In, um, who have been asking. So the comprehensive plan does say one thing. It says one objective is to create a wholesome home environment. That zone that you're about to approve includes homes. And I suppose we could debate the word wholesome, but my guess is that it would not be consistent with large drinking and gambling establishments. So consistency with the comp plan is not just about, it's about what we want in our community as far as businesses. It also talks about well-paying jobs in the economic section. Well-paying jobs. Now, we could debate that as well. Are these well-paying types of bait? But I'm just urging you to just let it go the way it is. It's a good amendment. The Long Range Planning Committee has spent a considerable amount of time to make sure that it's consistent, and as is, um, we don't need it. I know Councillor Sullivan stated he's always in favor of allowing the citizens of Scarborough to voice their opinions through a town-wide vote. And that's good, because that's democracy. And I think all of the councillors are on board with that. This has been asked, this amendment has been asked by the Downs, not the citizens, the Downs, to ask you to change and to amend this. Um, and as you know, the votes taken by the people of this town have already said five times no, don't expand gambling. That's putting the cart before the horse. If you're going to put the word gambling or casino in our ordinance, 
you are putting the cart before the horse. In my opinion, you should let the people tell you, we want gambling, and then we can say, okay, let's go back to it. And then the council will have more control over it. I'm urging you not to relinquish that type of control. Um, this is a huge and substantial change, so it might have to go back to the planning board. I urge it also to go back to, if you decide to do it, to go back to the Long Range Planning Committee. They have more experience with the comprehensive plan and could make a recommendation. They decided not to recommend it, and maybe it was political reasons or maybe not. Maybe it was because they didn't think it was consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, so you need to wrap, please. Okay, I'm wrapping up. Um, the... Ordinance as it is amended, or as it is proposed, and you guys passed first reading, still allows the Downs to ask us if we want the facility. It, there's, it doesn't change that. What they're asking is to simplify the process to allow gambling, and I don't think that's really the role of the town council um, to go against the comprehensive plan. Thank you. Karen DeAndre, Eagles Nest Drive. Um, uh, as it stands, I like the uh, new zoning. I think uh, the long-term uh, committee, the long-range planning committee, did a great job. I believe they worked on this for over a year. They got input from all sides, um, all stakeholders. Uh, I agree with uh, Sue Foley Ferguson, uh, I think that this needs to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. This new amendment is not consistent with the comprehensive plan. I, I have had experience with the comp plan. I think I read both comp plans through before I was even elected to the town council. Um, and nowhere in it does it talk about the citizens of this town wanting casinos or, or gaming. And so I think we need to really pay attention to that. What it does talk a lot about is quality of life in Scarborough. It talks a lot about open spaces and green spaces. We know very well that the citizens of this town often vote for money for green spaces. We've even seen it in down economies. Um, so I, I think that if this is something that the council wants to consider, I also agree that this is a substantive change. Um, this needs to, at the very least, have some more light of day. It needs to go at least back to the planning board, but I think also to the long-range planning committee. They are part of the process. They do represent the citizens. I do realize that they're advisory, but this is what they have really been dedicated to over the past year or so. And also, given that um, this issue is so controversial. I think this sort of last minute amendment also really needs to see the light of day because of that. We need to allow the citizens to have more say in, um, in this change. Um, I wasn't able to attend the first reading or the public hearing, but I did watch them on video. And what I saw at the, at the first reading was um, Dan Bacon, our great town planner talking about the new, uh, the new crossroads plan. And one of the things that struck me was that it's a flexible zone, and that's a good thing. Um, the other thing that really struck me about this was, even though this issue of gambling and casinos is not mentioned as an approved use, he did say that it's easy to change. It would take a one-line change to make it. So, um, so I don't see the difficulty in that. Um, Certainly this council has changed zoning before with little or no problem. Um, I just hope that if this is something that the council is considering that uh, you give it a little more light a day. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Karen Bashan. I live at 25 Ocean Ave. I am a citizen that is in favor of electronic gaming and a casino at Scarborough Downs. Um, Scarborough Downs has been in business here for 63 years. They've been a phenomenal business in town, very, very generous to our community. They have demonstrated that without incident, gambling can take place there and not disrupt our community. Um, what a lot of people may not realize is that harness racing is very, very important to the landscape of Maine. 
Um, were it not for harness racing, we wouldn't have our agricultural fairs. It also preserves open space. I know it's a sensitive issue. I believe that the wording in the last referendums was really, really confusing to people. And what happened was the, the, the track was forced to kind of rebut the confusion and not state how important harness racing is for all of us, for our community and for the state of Maine. I applaud the efforts that have taken place thus far with the partnering with Scarborough Downs to try to get this zoning right. We have 500 sacred acres located very, very strategically right off of exit 42. It's just a huge opportunity for Maine. This is a huge opportunity for Scarborough. Um, the track is tired right now. It needs, harness, the harness racing needs electronic gaming to support it. Without it, our horse farms in the rural landscape that all of us love get sold and the horses go out of state to earn a living. And then that turns into housing developments that require um, schools, roads, sewers. So there was a time when some people will say harness racing is dead. There was a time when we said farming was dead in Scarborough. That was in the 1990s when we developed all that land and now farming has made a comeback. I believe that harness racing can make a comeback too. And I see the glory days of, of harness racing having casino style gambling at the track and a huge opportunity for Scarborough. I would like to add that Oxford and Bangor aren't complaining about the revenue. Today, residents are asking that the town acquire Benjamin Farm. At the same time, they're also asking that we reduce our property taxes. The talk that's taken place thus far has been really, really good. We have one landowner with 500 sacred acres, if we get this right and the community clearly understands what they're voting on next time, it will be the decision of the voters whether they want this or not, but it will be a huge opportunity for Scarborough. Thank you. Susan Wilder of Three Tide Mill Lane in Scarborough. And I I think it's telling that three former town councilors have spoken against passing this amendment and cautioned consideration of this. I, as a citizen, happen to be adamantly opposed to a casino in town, and I believe this amendment makes it possible for, for one company to benefit, and, and I don't see the social benefit provided. A casino is not a progressive vision for Scarborough, and it draws in people with the least to spend on gambling. And I feel that's a crime and we need to uh, protect our citizens and those within the 90 mile radius who end up coming to a casino. Thank you. Other comments? Good evening. My name is Andrew Wingles. I'm a commercial real estate broker at the Bowles Company in Portland. I've been working with uh, Sharon Terry for the last two plus years in an effort to market Scarborough Downs property. Um, what's happened there is essentially nothing. Um, I don't know how many people have driven through Scarborough Downs recently, but there's, it's, a, it's really an amazing piece of land. And um, what we're trying to do, the, they, they came to us, myself, Ed, and Sharon, to talk about the change in zone. And there's a lot of the aspects of the zone that I was, I was in favor of from a demand standpoint. Um, housing is a critical component to it. They took out the industrial. There's enough industrial property now available that that's not necessary at the downs. Um, but in order to grow a property like that, which is, which is incredibly buffered, um, and incredibly located. Um, Please address your comments to us. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the the nature of the of the land suits perfectly for that use, 
and, and, and like Karen said, there's gambling there now. There has been for 60 years. Um, it's a choice people make. Um, from a demand standpoint, st talking strictly from a business perspective, and I know I don't, it almost sounds like a bad word, but in order to grow an economy, uh, you need to take advantage of what's available. Scarborough Downs is right in the middle of this town. There's, no, there's nobody using 300 acres of developable land that's, that the Crossroads District recognizes. Um, without a, without a, an anchor tenant to bring people into that site, there won't, as much as I agree with the Crossroads tenants, it's very difficult to make that grow because of the cost of infrastructure, the overall cost of a master plan. You can imagine developers, they can't spend more than an additional foot of road these days. The banks won't finance it. Um, there's a lot of issues that come with a, a casino. Oxford is thriving. Uh, there haven't been those issues that came up last time about, about the mob or prostitution or any of those issues. People go up there and have fun. It's their choice to do it. And, it, and it'll put $10 million in the coffers of, of the Oxford Hills region. Uh, I think what will happen in Scarborough, because I, I have people talk to me all the time about it because I represent the site, um, is there's, there's an incredible amount of business that is, is brought on by traffic demand, you know, hotels, but also retail, also office space. Uh, the infrastructure is there to use. The location is perfect. Um, and when they came to Ms. Terry about the about her thoughts on the zone. She was very, very cooperative. All she said, all we asked for was a, was a, was a piece in the, th in the zoning that didn't say no gaming because that was a confusing issue on the last referendum. And if it, if it simply says in the, in the event of a successful referendum, then that would be approved. That's a step in the right direction. And I think that's a, I think uh, Ms. Terry's stewardship of the land Deserves that. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments before I close that? <clears throat> All right. Hmm? I need a motion. I need a motion. Thank you. Yeah, you need to have your main motion yeah. first. Okay. Move approval. Second. Thank you. A motion to amend. Second. Yes, please read the amendment. I would like to move to amend order number 1342 to include light item 36, which would state <coughs> casinos or slot machine facilities as defined in chapter 31 of title 8 of the main revised statutes that are located within the same planned development as a harness racing facility and are licensed by the state of Maine in accordance with the requirements of chapter 31 of title 8 of the main revised statute, including the requirement that the casino or slot machine facility must be approved by the voters of the town in a municipal referendum, and that the town council has entered into a revenue sharing agreement with the owner and or operator of the casino or slot machine facility. I would also like my amendment to include renumbering item, line item number 37 through 42. Is there a second? Second. Discussion on the amendment. Just a question, um, or certainly open to thoughts. I know it's been brought up about if this is a substantive change or not, um, which would trigger going back to the planning board. I, I mean, I've heard that. I'm, I'm asking, and the manager, I guess, is yeah. what, what's the process for, for this? I, I think that's a decision that this body makes for itself. Uh, I think uh, it, it's opinion based whether it's, it's substantive or not. Uh, I would note, and I think it's been observed from the podium. This issue, though it does appear in kind of the final act of the council, certainly has been talked about in front and center in discussions for better part of a year. Um, so uh, from my perspective, is it's different in that respect, but I defer to your collective wisdom as to whether um, further process is required, if not uh, encouraged, just to make sure that everyone understands what the council is considering here. But there's, there's no right or wrong. There's no definitive answer. I think everyone has an opinion about whether it's substantive or not. Council, well, thank you. My feeling on it is that they've had it for a year. They sent it to us. 
I don't, I don't, I don't see the purpose in it going back to them again. That's, that's my personal feeling on it. I, uh, I, uh, I also concur. Um, the, uh, if the planning board, um, I, I don't see where they would change any mind on the council at this point. Um, either we're going to agree tonight to move forward with this or turn it, this amendment down. Either way, um, I don't see um, what substance the planning board could add to it. I think Dan kind of alluded to the fact that uh, the planning board had discussed it and wasn't opposed to it. They just didn't stick it in. So if we just send it back to them, uh, I don't, I don't see what they do other than send a recommendation back to us to approve it. Right. Uh, I sit as a liaison to the Long Range Planning Committee, and certainly I can attest to the fact that this topic has been discussed uh, numerous, in, numerous numbers of times that we met and discussed the Crossroads District. And as an advisor, advisory board, the Long Range Planning Committee is advisory, and they did not want to make a definitive stance, but certainly there was significant support. Um, I think as I look at it, as I sit here, it, um, it, to me, it's not important whether I would vote yes or no on a casino. What's important to me is the vote goes to the people. Correct. And so uh, whether it goes back as a uh, substantive uh, change to the planning board, uh, I, I think is not necessary in that the people are going to have the final say. If, if the people from the Downs decide to petition to put a referendum on the ballot, that's their choice. It's not our choice, but the, the, the ultimate choice is going to be with the residents of the town of Scarborough. And whether I vote yes or no, um, it, it's not going to win or lose my one, my one vote. Uh, the vote still goes to the, to the people, so the people still have the final say. Uh, and, and that's what I think is important, that the people have the final say. Uh, I think the Crossroad District in and of itself as the main motion certainly has opened up the doors for uh, the owners of that property to do much more with it than they can do right now as a B2 zone. And that's, I think, very, very important if we look at the future and the vision of Scarborough and where Scarborough, you know, it's not going to stand still. It hasn't stand in still. Uh, I've lived here 61 years. I've certainly seen a significant amount of change. Uh, and some of it I like and some of it I don't. But we can't put a fence around the town of Scarborough and lock the gate and say, okay, nobody else in. Uh, that's not how things happen. We can control it by zoning, certainly. Uh, but uh, that, that's, that's, one, that's the, the major way that we can control it. So uh, I'm certainly in favor of the main motion, and I, and I can support the amendment based on the fact that the vote will go to the people. It's mm -hmm. not going to be my decision. It's going to be the people's vote. And I just, can I just I'm make one more point. And Dan, correct, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think part of the reason that I'm in support of this is also how it's going to simplify the referendum. So by adding this into the language, it's going to help with the referendum in the sense of it takes it down to one question instead of two. So is that, is that correct, Dan? <coughs> Could be. Uh, I can speak on this and also um, Attorney McCall, uh, who's much more versed in um, state law on this matter than I. Um, but if there isn't this language um, in the district, then in the future, either a future council can amend the zoning district to allow, to add the same language in or to just allow casinos and slot machines, uh, et cetera, and then state law um, would have to be amended, et cetera. Um, or there can be a citizen referendum to amend the zoning, um, as I described, and there also, it's my understanding, need to be a uh, an additional citizen, additional question about allowing casino gambling per state law yep. within the town of Scarborough. Um, so I believe that's what you mean by two questions, one being to amend the Crossroads District to allow it specifically in this district, then a 
another question, maybe at the same referendum or a different time to satisfy state law um, to allow it within the town of Scarborough. Thank you. Appreciate and I think what's also important is that legal counsel has reviewed this um, proposed amendment. I think Council Blaze and Councilor uh, St. Clair are the ones that met with legal counsel as well as the town planner and the town manager, making sure that we were within the laws um, of the state and within yeah, I just want to be clear. It's not as if uh, this comes with staff recommendation, and certainly not the town attorney's recommendation. But hearing the the interest of council, we thought it best and wise to come up with language that it was the best it possibly could be. So I just want to be clear that <clears throat> that was the spirit with which we work with town attorney and present this to you tonight. Right. Right. And I think also it does not tie the hands of future councilors, as uh, Dan Bacon just stated. Should it go out to referendum and it fail, I mean, future councils could still insert verbiage later uh, or remove anything. So, other comments or discussion or questions? I uh, would we'll have a vote on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment? All those opposed? None. Okay, now to back to the main motion as amended. Any further discussion on the main motion as amended? Seeing none, all those in favor of the main motion as amended? None opposed. Thank you very much. Order number 1360 is act to approve the names to the planning board and the ad hoc historic committee as recommended by the appointments committee. Uh, move approval. Second. Are we going to read those names? As I find them. It would be to appoint Nicholas McGee as the second alternate to the planning board with a term to expire in 2013 and uh, approve the name of Craig Frederick to the Ad Hoc Historic Preservation Committee as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2015. Is there any public comment on the uh, nomination of these two folks to these two committees? Seeing none. Um, all those in favor? Thank you. Under new business order number 1361 is the first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to chapter 604 of the Animal Control Ordinance. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Same rule still applies. State your name and address. You get three minutes. And that gentleman in the checkered shirt was next in line and we make sure that he gets the chance. Speak at some point. Oh, okay. May, um, can, can we just wait just a minute? I just lost my train of thought of what I needed to do. I needed to ask for some input from um, the town manager and the Audubon Society and the IF and W. I'm sorry. I'll be brief. I just thought uh, I'm perhaps, out of practice. perhaps clarifying a couple of factual points might help and, and uh, change some comments that might be, uh, might be coming shortly. Um, one, I just want to clarify some uh, apparent misconceptions. I, I think part of the problem was uh, the incidents, uh, the incident back, uh, I believe, July 15, that really gave rise to this issue and brought it kind of back front and center. Uh, unfortunately, it was the facts of that incident appeared to have been incorrectly stated in the paper. So just for the record, the incident occurred at uh, 7 a.m. in the morning. It occurred uh, well beyond 150 feet from any known exposure or nesting area. Uh, in fact, it was along the water line. And for all those reasons, there's, no, there's been no action taken against the dog owner, uh, either by the main ward service, and the town is not considering any action either. So I just want to clarify that point. We've heard that a number of t times, and I feared we might hear it again tonight. The owner also was within the, within the ordinance. Um, he could be there without a leash. Yes, yeah, certainly. It was, so. it was 7 a.m. in the morning. She was there fully compliant with local ordinance. Um, I also just want to state um, what I can confirm is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has, is undertaking an investigation against the town for possible violation of the Endangered Species Act. Um, the status of that investigation, I cannot, I, I just don't know, frankly. I believe it has been concluded and the results of that have been handed over to the solicitor's office in the Department of Interior for review and evaluation. And I bring that up because there's been talk about potential fines and penalties and so on and so forth. Uh, that is all possible, but that's certainly not in front of us as we meet tonight. And the last piece, I just want to update the council and the public. 
coincident with all of this, uh, the town has been working with the Army Corps of Engineers and their partner agencies for the dredge project for the Scarborough River. A component of that project uh, is beach nourishment of Western Beach, which happens to be um, nesting habitat as well. And so as a, as a part of the permitting process for the dredge project, Army Corps of Engineers must consult with, their, uh, with other agencies, and in particular with, with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, specifically on uh, impact on habitat and, in this case, um, impact on threatened and endangered species. I bring that up because uh, just today we received the concurrence report, if you will, from U.S. Fish and Wildlife that is allowing the, the dredge project to go forward, though they are kind of drawing a line in the sand, pardon the pun, uh, that they expect the town to make changes to their local ordinance by next April, so we do have a bit of time, uh, to be compliant with their published plover guidelines. And I have copies of those. I can't recite those. Perhaps some of the professionals in the audience can. Um, they're available online, but in relevant part, uh, the proposal that the council is considering does in fact meet those guidelines. So I just thought those were relevant points that are worth just uh, stating at the outset just so everyone had the same information and certainly pleased to hear your comments. And I just wanted to give an opportunity for two folks that are in the audience to just give a brief uh, overview. Um, uh, the first person is Lindsay Tudor and she is with IF&W from the state of Maine. And there may be some questions that counselors may have of Lindsay or <coughs> Laura, uh, who will be next. Did you want to go up and stand with her or no? You can Come if you on, want Laura. to. <laughs> the second person is Laura Zitsky. Did I do, how did I do? Zitsky? Zitsky from the Maine Audubon Society. <laughs> so uh, they're just going to give some brief comments and if council has some questions of them, uh, a few questions and then we'll move to the public comment. <clears throat> Thank you for letting us speak and inviting us here and I do not envy the task before you. It is a complex issue. Um, we really appreciate the town revisiting their dog ordinance. We've worked with the town for many years. We have beach management agreements with the town of Scarborough for the protection of piping plovers and lease turns. We have had concerns about the voice control component of the dog ordinance. Um, so I am thrilled that you folks are considering revisiting your ordinance. Um, what I have today are uh, our department recommendations for changes to your ordinance. Um, so I, and I will leave these with the council as I stutter through it here. So. Obviously, the purpose of changing your dog ordinance is to prevent take of a listed species. You have four listed species that use your beaches. You have, as we have all learned, piping plovers that's federally listed as threatened, state listed as endangered. You have least turns. They are state endangered. You have red knots. Red knots is another shorebird that is currently going through the process of, um, it's a candidate species for federal listing as endangered. Those wheels are moving, that species will be listed as endangered. You also have uh, rosia terns. Rosia terns are federally listed as endangered and state listed as endangered. So a lot of the emphasis has been on protecting piping plovers but I think it's prudent to change your ordinance that will protect all these listed species so you don't have take occur on another species. So that's kind of how we've drafted our recommendations. So points to consider as you look at your ordinance. The big thing with the piping plovers is after hatch, these chicks move and they can be anywhere. And Laura has actually provided me with a map of uh, plover chick movements and how far they have been recorded away from their nest, away from the stake and twine, and I'll leave that with you as well. Um, fledglings can fly, so they can leave their nesting beaches. They can be found on any of your beaches. So I think whatever changes you do to your ordinance, you should do for all beaches. Um, 
whether or not they currently have plovers nesting on them. Another thing to remember, plover chicks, when they see danger, they're going to freeze. And they're just a little ball of fluff, the same color as the sand. So when they freeze, they're almost impossible to detect. I mean, you step on the little things. So keep that in mind. So for roseate terns and red knots, they're using your beaches now through October. So that's why we recommend any change to your dog ordinance should be a window of April 1 through September 15th. I mean, these birds are here even after September 15th, but if you use that window, it will be consistent with the restrictive window that we use for permit regulation. So, you know, we're willing to compromise on all fronts of this ordinance, and, and that would be a compromise. I would not ask for the end of October. Um, so, my department is mandated by the legislature to protect listed species, to sustain them and recover them. So I would be irresponsible if I did not say our first and foremost recommendation to prevent take would be a dog ordinance that would be no dogs on Scarborough beaches. Given that, I have a secondary recommendation, which is very much in line with what your draft dog ordinance is right now, um, and that being all dogs on leash only during April 1 through September 15th. And definition of a leash is a handheld device eight feet or less. And the reason for that is, as I discussed a second ago, these plover chicks, when they freeze, you cannot see them. So if you have a dog on one of the, the leashes that allow them to go out 15, 20 feet in front of the dog owner, that dog will be on top of a plover chick and the dog owner, there's no way they can even see what's happening. So that is why we recommend a short leash. Uh, let's see, other considerations, um, whatever changes you do, and I'm sure you've already thought of this, but to the dog ordinance, you would want to be consistent with your piping plover ordinance. Um, and looking at your piping plover ordinance, I would suggest, the department would suggest, keeping number four, section three, that says, when approaching a beach area where plover fencing is present, all dogs must be kept at least 150 feet from the stake and twine fencing. That's a good thing. We, we would um, recommend that you keep that. And also keep in the current dog ordinance, no dog shall be present on any beach between the hours of 9 and 5. That really helps um, lessen disturbance of dogs to these uh, endangered species. But I would suggest you change the dates to April 1 through September 15th. And the big thing, it's enforcement. And we all know this. And we all know it's, it's very difficult to fund. Uh, my department, you know, it is our policy to work with municipalities and communities to help protect these species. Uh, we our budgets, like everyone's, are severely limiting right now, but we are hoping that we can provide you with some support from our game wardens to help you with enforcement. Obviously, they don't enforce town ordinances, but I think a game warden on a beach can be effective outreach to <coughs> beachgoers and dog owners. We would help you and hopefully can provide you with that. And the other part of this is outreach. And again, we are here for you. We can provide you with our expertise on printed materials, brochures, signage. As part of our beach agreements, we have agreed to provide the town with signage. Um, I have funds for that. So we're very willing to work with you folks in any regard um, to better protect these plovers and really to prevent take. Because whether you like the birds or not, when take occurs, it's just not pretty. So um, I will leave these recommendations with you. And I can answer questions. I also have with me Charlie Todd. He's our Endangered and Threatened Species Coordinator. He has a very good understanding of the Endangered Species Act. I also have Brad Zitsky. He's our Regional Biologist. He's uh, 
man on the ground in your area, and he's a wealth of knowledge. And, of course, we have Laura, and she's a wealth of knowledge. So I don't know if you want to ask me questions now or later or just questions to Ed. Uh, yeah. Uh, I noticed uh, we have a sheet of paper here that has uh, uh, different municipalities around and also state beaches. I understand that no state beach allows dogs at any point in time. That's correct. Is that primarily because of the endangered species? I, I bet it's from variable. Well, well state park beaches, um, no dogs are allowed from April 1st. Oh, you have yeah. to speak over into first. the mic. microphone. Oh, sorry. Um, State parks, uh, no dogs are allowed on beaches from April 1st through um, through October 1st, and the rest of the time dogs are permitted in the winter months, but they must be on leash. Thank um, you. The, you know, that's Bureau of Parks and Lands. Um, but, um, for example, um, IFNW has part of, Skip, of Higgins Beach, um, and there are no dogs on the IFNW-owned section of beach, but um, the dates are a little, they're, they're probably the same. I don't know the exact date. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should. Maybe Brad does. Um, Councilor Blaze was just asking is the reasoning behind that. The reasoning, I don't know for the Bureau of Parks and Lands. I imagine it's because endangered species are there, but also it's probably a recreational, a, a people issue as well. I, I can't speak for that agency, but for Higgins Beach, it's really to protect the wildlife, whether it's shorebirds or piping plovers or. Well, I, I was going to talk a little bit about other municipalities that have uh, beaches with nesting piping plovers, so that might help um, help with this discussion a little bit. Uh, I just wanted to mention that, uh, by and large, other municipalities in Maine have stricter um, pet control rules. Old Orchard Beach in Saco, I know Old Orchard was mentioned earlier, um, are less stringent than Scarborough, um, but it's important to note that both communities have history of significantly less plover activity than Scarborough beaches, um, so it, it, it makes it challenging. But I will also say that um, I'm sure we're going to be working with those communities for um, to ch change their dog ordinances as well on beaches. Um, looking at communities all across the state that have uh, nesting piping plovers, nearly all cities and towns have leash laws in the summer, um, and some don't permit dogs at beaches at all. Um, during the during the summer months, uh, a gunquit uh, it does not allow dogs from April 1st to October 1st. And uh, we mentioned Bureau of Parks and Lands, State Parks has actually the same. They have the same laws um, for Parks and Lands. I would think it's yeah more wildlife related, as as Lindsay talked. But for a gunquit, wildlife is certainly a component, but. Obviously, Agunquit is known for its beach, and it's, it's, a, it's a tourism draw, so I think that's actually largely for people as well. Um, so just wanted to point that out. Um, you have the readout, but I just I will just wanted to mention that um, Kennebunkport and Biddeford beaches um, that have municipal sections require leashes year-round, um, summertime restrictions of no dogs for 9 to 10 hours a day, Wells allows unleashed dogs from September 16th through March 31st, but from April 1st through September 15th, all dogs must be leashed, and during the summer months, dogs aren't allowed from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So um, I just thought that might be helpful, what's going on in other uh, towns and, and cities that have piping plovers nesting on beaches. Um, I also wanted to share Maine Audubon's experience as, uh, as, a, as a manager of several properties in the state, um, because uh, we do have several sanctuaries, and this includes, um, you know, Gilsland Farms in Falmouth, but it also includes uh, the, the Borstone Mountain Preserve um, up in hiking trails up in northern Maine, mass landing trails in Freeport, and much more. For years, dogs were permitted on leashes. However, enforcement was a challenge. People bring their dogs on leashes, and once out on the properties, leashes they were, get removed and dogs run free. I think it's particularly tempting for, uh, for owners to let their dogs run near water, where so many dogs like to swim. Enforcement, uh, which we, has come up several times as, a, as an issue, it just became impossible. We could, not be, um, we could not be all places at all times, and people just let their dogs off leash. So eventually, Maine Audubon decided that the best thing would be to not allow uh, dogs on our wildlife sanctuaries for the protection of wildlife. 
Uh, initially, people were upset and there was a backlash, but um, within a year or two, the fuss died down and now it's known and expected and it, it's not an issue. So um, I just wanted to share that. Um, and I also just wanted to reiterate two biological components um, that Lindsay mentioned, um, but just wanted to drive home that piping plovers, they, they start arriving here in Maine in March. Um, but nesting season begins in earnest in, in mid-April um, and typically it extends through mid to late August, um, the birds have fledged. Currently, all the, all the birds have fledged as of last week, which is, is nice. Um, but starting July and August, other species of shorebirds um, that have compl completed, already completed their breeding season um, in northern nesting areas are coming down through Maine on their long journeys that stretch from the tundra to the tropics. And, um, as Lindy, Lindsay said, this includes other endangered species um, like red knots and also we have roseate terns and least terns which are endangered and nest here in the state and use our beaches um, throughout the summer and fall. So just a little bit more explanation about the seasonal component and lastly, I know this has come up and I hope you have the little map. You have the little map. Um, and this is just, pine, just, just just an example of Pine Point over the last three years. Um, it shows the nesting site locations of, of the, over the last three years and then also where the chicks, where they ranged. So as we mentioned, chicks, piping plover chicks are what we call precocial. That's the, and they really are. They're, they're precocious. Within hours of hatching, they're running up and down the beach because they have to feed themselves. So they're down at the water's edge. They're up on the edge of the dune running around um, and capable of great movement. If they're not in a place where they want to be, we had a, a pair actually this year at Old Orchard just south of the pier. They, within a, a week of, of being alive, they hiked over a mile um, and went south to Saco. They crossed Goose Bear Brook and everything. So um, ultimately their total movement was about one and a half miles away. So uh, it, it demonstrates how difficult from a management perspective to really, um, to really, you know, cordon off where they are because they're, they're just trying to survive, they need to forage, they need to stay safe and so they're capable of great movements and will do whatever they have to do to survive. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I was under the impression at our last ordinance meeting that there was only one nest in Scarborough. There was one nest in Pine Point this year. Just so all of, but I mean, I'm talking all of Scarborough. There's one nest. Is that? No, there were two nesting pairs at Scarborough Beach, um, and then there were, and there was one nest at uh, Higgins Beach this year. Okay. So a total of three this season. Plus the one at Pine Point. So there were four nesting pairs in Scarborough this mm -hmm. season. Okay. Um, and, and you stated that they come in. They start coming in March. Uh, the, the, because uh, I was talking with a retiree who is a frequenter to the beach, and um, his vision, he, he's not seen them until mid-April, actually late late April, but they do start coming in March. They are. I get, I, st I think my phone call that they're here was n March 9th this year. Um, one of the great challenges for these birds that's, you know, both a benefit and a challenge really is that they're really well camouflaged. Um, and, th and they're not everywhere. They're not at every beach in March, but um, they can be anywhere. That, that's sort of the challenge. So typically we see them first at um, beaches where they have been successful in the past. So there are certain beaches in Kennebunkport where we usually see our first birds and they're there in March. Thank you. Any other questions? Laura or Lindsay? Before we allow further comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to public comment. So I'll open it back up to public comment. Gentlemen in the plaid shirt, you get your chance. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Noah Perlett. I live at 20 Windsor Pines Drive here in Scarborough. Um, I'm the owner of a dog that is completely obsessed with swimming. Um, I am also a ornithologist on the faculty at the University of New England. Here I've been studying field ecology of birds for 15 years. Um, I'm here to very much support the last two speakers. Um, I believe in the ecology and the importance of these organisms on our beaches. Uh, and I, I do think uh, Ms. Tudor brought up a, a very critical point 
in that, yes, we're here talking about plovers, but plovers are only one species of bird that we're discussing when there are many other species. By my reading, um, just thinking about Pine Point Beach in and of itself, from the dune to the beginning of the water, uh, 11 species of listed special concern in the state, three threatened species listed, and three endangered species. Um, so that adds up to me to 17 species to be in, encountered just on Pine Point Beach. Um, now, I'm talking about state-listed species, which is, of course, different than federally listed species, but nonetheless, um, it's, and I think it's you know, important, yes, plovers can be used as a bellwether uh, for all of these other species, but it's to be considered. Um, my second point is that I'm a taxpayer here, and I would really not want to have to pay taxes in order to pay fines for takes of endangered species. Um, that would be, in my opinion, I'd rather support schools or firemen or police officers. Um, I'd like to have laws that completely prevent that, allow us to enjoy our beach, um, allow us to have our dogs on the beach on leash, and allow our kids to be able to see piping plovers, you know, and, and see their, have their kids as well. Uh, the last point I want to bring up, and this is going to seem rather tangential, but um, I hope you at least consider it, is this past July there was a report that came out from a uh, nonprofit group that listed the most polluted beaches in the state. And Ferry Beach, as I'm sure you all know, was uh, tied at number five out of the 60th out of 60 beaches in Maine. And uh, coliform bacteria is one of the main issues that is listed under this. And coliform bacteria comes from poop, um, quite frankly. And having owners with their dogs on a leash, I, I think makes more responsible dogs. They just see it. They're going to pick it up. And I'm not saying that dog owners, that when their dogs are off leash, are bad owners. But frankly, sometimes the dog poops behind you and you just miss it. You know, and that's just, the, that's just sort of the honest truth, and, and by accident, absolutely. Um, and so I think there are uh, many effects, many effects that can come beyond simply a discussion of piping plovers. And, uh, and again, if this is a difficult thing for me to say, is that my dog, you know, I have a dog, and my dog loves to swim, but my dog's going to swim on a leash. Um, so thank you. Good evening. My name is Joanne Mahoney. Um, I'm a little nervous, so this is my first meeting. Um, we started coming here on vacation 17 years ago. Um, we came to Pine Point because we could bring our dogs. Um, could you give us your name again? Joanne Mahoney at 18 Pillsbury. Um, we brought friends with dogs, families with dogs. We were by Avenue 1 where a sign was posted that said what the ordinances were. We obeyed the ordinances. We now live here year-round. I've come from another state. Um, we are talking about a sunrise to 9 a.m. window, basically three hours to have these dogs off leash. Responsible dog owners know when their dogs should be on a leash or off a leash. Irresponsible dog owners do not care whether it's this ordinance, new ordinances, and they will not pay attention. I have the privilege to leave my dog off leash in the mornings. I like that. He plays ball. If I'm challenged by another dog or someone comes up, I pick my dog up and ask, is your dog friendly? If they say no, I walk with my dog away. That's responsible. Saturday, a lady was on the beach at 2 o'clock in the afternoon with her dog. I nicely approached her and informed her, you, um, are you aware that we have ordinances? From 9 to 5, no dogs on the beach. She said to me, lady, mind your own business. Thank you. So we need, there's, I'm all about protecting the plovers. You know, I've been here 17 years. We know when they're there. We try to respect the space. It was a very unfortunate accident. We all feel for it. However, we need proper signage on all the paths. I belong to Pillsbury Association. We were going to put up our own signs stating the town ordinances. This we have to educate the people. 
We have many visitors, summer visitors, that bring a lot of commerce and a lot of trade to the beaches. They want to bring their dogs. We don't want to shut that down. It's a privilege. Um, how about the children that need to be on voice command? <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about the dirty diaper I picked up last week in the past? There's the poop. <laughs> yeah, so we have other issues than the dogs. There are many, many factors. Let's not single out the one. Let's try to work together, educate the public. We're, we have to educate people that influx this neighborhood and all the beaches that do not know what the rules are and do not have respect them. And let them pay the price, not us. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dominic Rialli. I live on 5 Doomfield Lane, Scarborough. I've lived on this beach now between Olachet and Scarborough for almost 30 years. I love the beaches, and that's why I bought a house in Scarborough. My dogs absolutely, absolutely love the beach. My dogs, I throw the ball out. He swims about 200 yards on open, open water. It's impossible for me to swim with my dogs. I'm not a swimmer. I can't swim. On the leash, it's impossible. What upsets me is a taxpayer, a business owner, and a resident of Scarborough is that we all care about animals, regardless if it's a bird, if it's a horse, or if it's a dog. But I, I would think that most people would, would consider that animals do deserve some protection too. I mean, I, I, I happen to have dogs, and dogs love to go on the beach, and we are restricted for three hours a day to take them there. Now you're considering put them on the leash, and or maybe from... March to October. But let's face it, in this state, you go down that beach in January, you're freezing to death. You can't stay there a long time without freezing. So in the summer months is the only time we can enjoy it and the pets can enjoy it. Now, the young lady spoke about the clovers being very, very, um, um, they freeze when they, they, sus they suspect something. So my thing is, and I live right on, on the waterfront. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of people running around, laying on the beaches. What would stop them from laying on, on one of those birds or stepping on them while they're jogging away? I mean, there's all kinds of things other than, than dogs that could hurt these, these birds. And I'm in favor of protecting them. But why do you want to penalize the, the dogs to save another one? I mean, I think we should find... a a ground in, in the middle that takes care of everybody. And every time something happens, it's always the dogs. Now, I clean up my dogs, and, and, and we can all assure in this room that if we walk that beach enough time, we're going to find a little pile that somebody didn't pick up. Maybe they didn't see it. And I understand that. But most of all, it didn't, excuse me, and then the town falls on this too. Because in the winter months, after September something, all the barrels disappear. You know, why, if the town is so concerned what happens at that beach, why don't they leave some barrels every so many miles so somebody, because in the winter months, they carry that bag in your hand out of your pocket, you're going to freeze to death. So, you know, you should have a place you can dispose of this product, you know. So that's a consideration that the council should, should think, you know. But I'm really against that every time, you know, I was shocked when the lady said there's only two nests in Scarborough, if I understood her right. No. This, yeah, I understand, this season. So what I'm saying is there's thousands and thousands of dogs. So why should the dogs suffer, and God forbid, if we lost another bird? I, I'm, I really mean that. I'm not being wise. You know, but still, dogs should have some consideration. In the, in the United States of America, we spend billions and billions of dollars on animals. I mean, we have... Uh, doctors all over, the, all over Scarborough, they live on us taking dogs in, they have them checked, so on and so forth. I mean, it's part of our lives, it's part of our families. And to me, every, and now this is the third time I come to these meetings, and that, that's all we talk about, removing the dogs off the beach, or removing the dogs off the beach. Well, if we're going to do that, folks, let's remove all the swimmers, let's remove all the joggers, let's remove all the sightseers. Can you wrap, can you thank wrap you. up? Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you.
Excuse me. Once again, maybe some of you just got here. Uh, the council chair asked for no applause. <coughs> I'd like to try to get through everybody's comments, please. Uh, and no laughter because she stole my line about the kids, so i got to leave that one out. <laughs> but um, uh, So Katie Foley, 3 Lucky Lane in Scarborough. Um, I wanted to thank, start off actually by thanking Mr. Hall for his comments at the beginning because that was kind of the beginning of what I wanted to say tonight is that you know, all behavior has motivation. It doesn't matter if you're standing in the corner, there's a reason for it. If you're the person that's up front and speaking out, there's a reason for it. And uh, that was the piece of this that I was missing, and, that, and I still am. I don't think we have an answer, but um, I knew it had to be driven, you know, an amendment changed to the ordinance had to be driven by some kind of motivation. Um, and so was that, you know, unmanageable numbers of complaints? I don't know. I'm not you. Uh, you're the ones that get those emails. And I also want to just acknowledge how difficult your job is. Um, I begged my sister not to run because it was a horrible, thankless job, and so thank you for your service. Um, so anyway, we do, I do understand uh, the position you're in. It's a tough position to be in, especially with this recent incident that happened, um, and that you have a strong sense of uh, commitment to this community and to us as taxpayers to protect us. But I want you to make sure that as you consider this and you go forward, you keep your motivators in check. Is it because it's the best thing for the citizens? Is it the best thing for the dogs and the beaches? Is it the best thing for the plovers? Or are we hiding from a, a fine that's impending on us? Is there another creative solution we can come to that will appease all of those factors? So they have different solutions. Um, so the concern is really is uh, that simply amending the animal control ordinance alone will not protect the plovers any further. Um, nor will it necessarily protect the town against any further liability. In fact, a lawyer that I spoke to said if you make more stringent laws and you continue to, and I think someone else spoke to this, don't enforce them, you're still going to find yourself in a situation where you're liable. So there's that. Um, in my professional life, I use a lot of data to help me with decisions, so I think that was my crutch, and I kind of started to try to do some research here. I want to share some quickly with you. Um, and the funny thing about data, as we all know, is it can get skewed a lot of different ways. I'm just reporting what I found. Um, so in New England, we have the highest plover recovery rate um, of anywhere in the country at 264%, uh, even though we have the fewest viable habitats. Um, the Audubon reports that for a full species recovery to work, uh, they must hit and maintain an average of one, this is specifically for plovers, but I'm not the ornithologist this guy is, um, 1.5 fledglings uh, for every pair that successfully nests and hatches. I just quickly went through the data the last three years, um, 1.7, 1.8, and 1.9. So the recovery rates that they're looking for is there. Uh, the species is thriving and surviving and doing well, even given the ordinance that we currently have. Uh, another piece of data, when you look at the numbers, the, that six to nine time frame, that off-leash time, it's, less, or it's right around 12% of the hours in a week. Um, cut it back to six to eight if you want, but I think what we're asking you for is a little bit more time to uh, work with us. Uh, you have a lot of citizens here who uh, really um, want to be creative. I, I will give you my letter because it has some of those solutions in there, including working with um, local experts, uh, maybe involving students who could recover some credit on a project for uh, habitat and species preservation, that kind of thing. Better signage is a huge issue. Um, it's, just, it's just not signed well enough, but I do agree, your, your beach regular goers, the ones who live here, that go with their dogs regularly, we're your best stewards. Um, we're constantly, you know, not constantly, but I pick up other people's poop when I have to. Um, one last sample, and I'm just going to leave these both with you. Uh, this would be going f uh, signage for renters. Um, that's a big issue. Uh, and it should be every property management company should have this information so that as people come in with their dogs, they know what our ordinances are. So thank you. Thank you, Kate. Hi, I'm Gail Bruns, 39 Hanson Road. I've lived in town about 40 years. I have a couple of dogs that I like to take on the beach occasionally. And I'm one of those people that always have my dog on a leash, so I'm not as emotionally invested as many of the people here in the audience, uh, because I know my dogs would definitely pursue a bird. They would kill a bird in a second if they could. So uh, being a responsible person, I never would allow them to be off leash. But I think that our current um, ordinance that we have, you know, is providing a few hours out of the day during that um, 
bird season that um, people can really go, still go and enjoy the beach. If that were enforced and people could actually get out there during that time period, I think that would make a lot of people very happy. The problem is you have people still taking dogs to the beaches all day long. You have them taking them to the beach after five at night without a leash. I went down the other night to Pine Point. Um, and I don't like to be approached by other dogs because my dogs go crazy. Um, so I like to have them stay at a distance and a couple of dogs came charging at us. And I was like, you know, oh, please keep your dog away. But I didn't know who I was talking to who because I couldn't see the owner. He was quite some distance away. And finally he came up and I informed him of the ordinance. And he, you know, wasn't aware of it, he said. Um, and he didn't leash his dogs and he left. And there was another lady right behind me that reinforced everything I said. You know, please put your leashes on. He ignored her. Um, so, you know, regardless of the laws, there are still going to be plenty of scoff laws. Um, concerning this bird that will um, blend in with the environment and not move, I can't imagine this bird being compatible in the world we live in today. <laughs> I mean, we have bird sanctuaries such as Scarborough Beach where there are no dogs allowed. That's wonderful. Let them breed all they want there. There aren't people there, but there are people on Higgins Beach. There are people on Pine Point Beach. Those people aren't going away. If I live there, I've got a cat, I've got a dog, even if I don't let them out, they're going to get out. I'm sorry. They're going to escape now and then, so there's going to be damage no matter what because we have people here. We've had people here for years. Um, I can't imagine a plover wanting to even consider putting a nest there. Um, I mean, it's, it's ludicrous to even think about it, but they are going to come, I'm sure, at times. Obviously, they have. But I'm thinking they're probably going to some of the less populated parts of the beach. And I think a good part of Higgins Beach is probably not even suitable habitat whatsoever. I mean, I think it's a pretty moot point to even say, you know, you can't take a dog out there when there aren't going to be the plovers, but I don't know about the other birds, so that's another issue, certainly. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is a lot of people don't have options for where to let their dogs exercise and run. They don't live on a farm. They don't live out, you know, someplace where they've got a lot of exercise territory. And where are these people going to go? So we need a dog park, if nothing else. Um, we have places in the town where one could exist, and I think that that should be something we would really consider if, in fact, we can't use the beaches for recreation for the dogs. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Glennis. Glennis Chabot, um, 12 Houghton Street. Um, I've heard a bit about education tonight, and I'd like to share with you uh, what the Higgins Beach Association has been doing to educate dog walkers uh, during the past couple years. Um, last summer, 20 volunteers spent mornings and early evenings on the beach educating dog walkers about plovers, the Scarborough Dog Ordinance, and the restricted areas. Uh, this year, Maine Audubon and IFW prepared this handout that we distributed to every single cottage at Higgins at the beginning of the season. Uh, Maine Audubon and IFW also uh, put together a complete packet for us to give to the two major rental agencies to be put into the cottages that are rented. Um, we also um, have breakfast every Wednesday morning at Higgins and we distributed um, piping plover postcards uh, and on the back it tells how you can help protect the piping plovers. Uh, we gave these to the children and the teenagers along with plover tattoos as a way to educate the children. Um, we also, the town, uh, worked with Public Works um, and we now have uh, seven signs uh, at Higgins Beach uh, with the Scarborough Dog Ordinance on it. So that is a way to educate people who come to the beach. Now, despite these educational efforts, Dogs continue to be off-leash on IFW property and in the plover restricted areas. Dogs continue to be off-leash after 5 p.m., even though uh, SCABO does have an existing ordinance um, requesting that. So have our education efforts succeeded in protecting the plover's nesting area at Higgins? I would say we might have a B or an A for effort, but I think we have an F for results. 
because we are still seeing lots of violations despite, despite all our educational efforts. Now, there are many, many responsible dog owners, but there are just too many irresponsible dog walkers who don't care about our beaches, who don't care about beach users, who don't care about endangered species, and just don't respect our ordinances. Education continues to be a priority, but alone it simply is not effective in deterring irresponsible behavior exhibited by some dog owners on our beaches. I personally feel that a change in the dog ordinance is necessary. If dogs are allowed on Scarborough beaches during the plover nesting season, then a definite plan for enforcement is crucial if you are really serious about protecting the piping plovers. Thank you. Thank and you. I have the packets for all of you, along with Tessie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where are you going to put yours? <laughs> Hi, my name's Douglas Lundier, it's 26 Fowler Farm Road, Scarborough. Um, I'm going to try and speak for the majority rather than the minor uh, minority tonight. Uh, I'm strongly against any further restrictions on dogs at Scarborough beaches. The existing uh, restrictions were put in place as a compromise solution and they're working well, believe it or not. It is a balance between the people who want to exercise their dogs and the people who don't want to see any dogs on the beaches at all. During summer there is a total ban during the day. That is one huge compromise. That's what we've got to put up with as dog owners. Leashing the dog in the evening, that is another compromise. The only real freedom we have is in the morning and during the winter season. We understand the restrictions and we abide by them. I walk Higgins Beach twice daily in all weather throughout the year. I and many other dog walkers clean the garbage from the beach every morning. There is always trash. We pick up spent firework casings, beer bottles, cans, plastic containers, rotting carcasses of fish, birds and any other dead animal washed up at high tide. It's not a pleasant task, but it gives me a pride in keeping a nice pristine beach, both for myself and all those visitors. To walk your dog on the beach is a lifestyle to many, many people. It is a large social club and it gives pleasure to Scarborough residents and visitors alike. Please do not take that lifestyle away from us. Thank you very much. Could, could you repeat your last name for us? Lund Yates. Yates. Okay. L-U-N-D dash Y-A-T-E-S. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <clears throat> Another former counselor. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say that. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Bill Kennedy, 23 Downey Lane. I don't have a dog, and my friend that does have the dog, we hardly ever take it to the beach or anything. But I wanted to talk about voice control. Voice control works with a dog that is trained. If it doesn't work, it's not voice control, and as far as I'm concerned, give them a ticket. Okay? I want to tell you a story. We were walking a dog. Terry and I, it's her dog. We were in an area in an adjoining town. It's a nice tar road. It's uh, no traffic. There's a nice sidewalk on the side. There's a wide open field that's mowed. A beautiful place to walk a dog. It was drizzling out. And Councilor Sullivan's, I'm sure, seen this. Sometimes we'll walk the dog. The dog is walking. We're in the car, okay? In this case, uh, in that other town, uh, the dog was probably about 300 feet ahead of us, and we came across a lady that had a little dog on a leash. She couldn't let it go. It would have taken right off on her. She said, that dog looks like it's with you. And I said, yeah, watch this. Little tap on the horn. That dog turned around, come trotting back, came to the window, turned his head, and said, basically, what do you want? You know, That dog is under voice or horn control. Would have done the same thing with voice. And, you know... I contacted the police department. They don't have statistics on what you have for complaints, warnings, summonses, dogs at large, not under voice control. I was told that they can only get that by going through, back through all the uh, animal complaints and whatever, doing research, which they're not required to do under freedom of information. I thought they would have those statistics. 
but maybe the police chief has an idea on the top of his head whether, you know, many people have been warned or summoned or whatever. But I think really if a dog's not under voice control, it's an enforcement thing, and I don't think that the enforcement is being done. We have people, we have police officers, we have animal control, we hire people to patrol the beaches. So I think there could be more enforcement, and I hope the council does ask what the amount is of uh, complaints, summonses, warnings that were given. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bill. My name is James Solly, S-O-L-L-E-Y. I live at 17 Pinehurst Lane in Falmouth, Maine. I decided to come up and speak for the out-of-towner. Uh, for the last eight years, uh, my wife and I have walked our dogs at Pine Point uh, five to six days a week, and my wife does walk in January in the middle of the cold season uh, with other people who do there. As a retired CPA, I kind of look at things black and white in a financial perspective, and I'd like to bring up a couple of points to you. Because I've been walking at the beach there for so long, we've gotten to know a lot of the people who come here as tourists only because they can bring their dogs with them. I'd like to remind you that it's the affluent who look at their dogs as part of their family, usually at a higher level than their children. <laughs> and therefore, they bring them with them on vacation so they can afford to pay the extra rental uh, to do that. If you look at Pine Point Beach in the uh, January, fall, uh, winter time frame, there's only about 30% of the people who are there. That's because 70% are only in town for five and a half months because they live in Florida, Hawaii, other places. They have homes on the beach. Uh, they bring their dogs with them. You're talking about putting restrictions on those people who are your residents, who are residents here but don't vote, uh, the entire time that they're here. These are the same people who you've just raised their property taxes, and they're looking. Uh, people make decisions, financial decisions, on a final point that breaks me. Okay, so you raise my property taxes. And now you're going to take my right away to walk my dog on the beach in front of my house. Uh, so I would, I would say that you need to look at this from two perspectives. Number one, you will lose a considerable amount of financial tourism uh, to this town if you make the changes that you're talking about making. Number two, you may lose a lot of residents and may end up with beach property losing value because of people selling because you went over that final leg. So I would hate to see the tourism people of Scarborough go through the same uh, processes and losing jobs as we've seen from the farmers in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, we need to return to common sense. I would uh, strongly urge you not to change your current rules. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other folks? Please queue up. It's now ten, almost 10 after. We don't take up new items after 10.30, so we got a few other things to take care of. Seth Fernald, 45 Maple Avenue. Seth, we do repeat your last name. Uh, Fernald, F-E-R-N-A-L-D. I actually had two questions I don't know if I'm able to ask. Uh, one is, are any of these endangered birds nesting on Ferry Beach at all? No. No? No. Okay. Uh, and then two, is the current ordinance having a positive effect on the nesting of the endangered, endangered birds, or is the trend going down or up as far as the recovery and the survival rate? Recent trends are going up. One of the trends Okay. The answer to that is recent trends are going up, but it's difficult to uh, determine that specifically. Yeah. Okay. So the current ordinance does not seem to be hurting the nesting. Okay. I, I just don't know why I would well, be changing it. No, that's not what she's saying. Oh, okay. So we don't know if it's affecting. Okay. There's many different factors that okay. influence the nesting. Okay. 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 She's saying other beaches are having. Okay. Statewide productivity is going up. Okay. Not so much in Starbucks. 
Okay. And do, bur do the dogs seem to be affecting? Okay, can you, can you, can you we can't have a debate with uh, No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not, I'm not debating. I, I haven't this, replied. What she's saying is not getting out okay. to the people that are watching on TV, and that's the problem. So, But basically what she's saying is that there's more okay. uh, more activity at other beaches. Scarborough is, Scarborough is down. Okay. So, um, but can you put a reason to it is the question, and I guess that's something we need to explore. So. Okay. So we're not sure if it's yeah. the dogs. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. My name is Joanne Rosine, R-O-S-E-N. I live at 17 Wrightfield Drive in Scarborough. This, too, is my first time in a council meeting in Scarborough. I've been a resident now for nine years. Um, eight of those years, this ordinance has been in place, and I've been a dog owner for seven of those years here. My first dog was a trained Walker Coon Hound who was never allowed off leash anywhere. The nose would have taken him to New Hampshire before I could have caught him. So, and he's, and it's just instinctive in hounds to hunt. Other animals, it's not that instinctive in. I have a golden retriever now who could care less if the animals come in, the wild animals come into our house, he will welcome them in. And so I think it all depends upon the dog, the breed, as well as the dog owner. This ordinance has been in place, as I said, eight years, and I haven't seen a lot of enforcement of it on the beaches, as other people have mentioned here tonight. And when you do mention it to people, you don't get a really good response. Because um, it's those people that don't care, they don't care. As a teacher for many, many years, I understand that you have a student that's not obeying the rules. They really don't care what the rules are, you know? Um, and you're not going to make changes of that by punishing all the other students to make the rules stronger for them. So I guess what I'm saying here is that we've had one unfortunate accident in the eight years that this ordinance has been in place, and it was a very unfortunate accident. But it was an accident. It wasn't intentional. And we need to enforce what we have in town before we start putting layers and layers and layers on top of it. Because if we just keep putting layers and we don't enforce those layers, we're right back where we are right now. Okay? I'd like to know what the town could do to try to enforce the ordinances, more signage, patrol. I mean, could we hire some students in the summer months? I know we don't have lifeguards, but they could be beach patrol with radios that could maybe radio in if there is a problem and somebody's giving a lot of trouble by not following the ordinance. We also have an ordinance for no smoking, which is a whole other meeting. Um, but that's not being enforced either. You know? And I too, like other dog walkers, we walk, we have our little dog bags, and many a times I pick up things that don't even come from the dogs. They're trash from kids, they're cigarette butts, there's so many other things. We are your good stewards, as somebody said. Let us come in on this, form a committee with dog owners, non-dog owners, with people from the Audubon Society, with council members, and let us all try to work together and see what we can come up with. Maybe the real answer is enforce what we have. Okay? Um, and just one other thing, I have a question for the council. A young man in this town who happens to be my next door neighbor who's going to be a senior at Scarborough High School sent an email to you all, and I don't know if you received it. Um, I have read what he came up with, and I do think it's an excellent idea of maybe putting some type of interns from your departments on the beaches during those critical months, and those interns kind of watching and guiding where those nests are, Please speak to the and educating, I'm sorry, and educating people. They're the bird people. That's recall, why I looked at them. I, I don't recall that email, and I read, I've read every email that I get. So yeah, we ask him to send, resend that. Councilor Holbrook and I actually responded to him earlier. Oh, okay. I okay. So, so it did come through, but you may not have all read it. it okay. <laughs> yeah, it, just, it didn't come through until later today. So okay. 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 But it does talk about a lot of different ideas, and I think coming from a young man, senior in high school, to have that thought, I thought it was really good. I would agree with you. I thought mm -hmm. very impressed by it. Very impressed. Yes, so, okay, thank you very much. Next. My name is Roland Grenier. Uh, I live at 88 East Grand Avenue, Pine Point. Um, 
most of my travels around that area are from the Old Orchard Beach line to Pine Point Road. In that area, I have seen two signs talking about the dog ordinance. There are many, many, many access roads to the beach, many paths, but there's only two signs. One is accurate as I understand it. The other one is right along East Grand Avenue at the Old Orchard Beach line, and that does not agree with the other sign that is accurate. If you want people to obey an ordinance, two things. Number one, they have to know what the ordinance is. Don't have confusing signs, but do have signs, and you have woefully too few. Secondly, any time you expect people to obey a law or an ordinance, you have to enforce it. And somebody made the comment earlier that we get an F for enforcement. That's true. We really don't. I'm out there on that beach. I'm out there on the beach between 7.30 and 9 o'clock, depending on when my dog gets me out of bed. And uh, I'm also out there after 5 o'clock. I occasionally am out there during, not with my dog, but I am occasionally out there uh, during the day. I'm not a sun person. I'd much rather not get melanoma and sit in the shade in my backyard. But when I'm out there, I see dogs that aren't supposed to be there. There's nobody enforcing it. I'm not saying there has never been anybody on that beach to enforce it, but I've never seen them. In seven, 16 years in this house, I've never seen anybody on Point Point, Pine Point Beach enforcing an ordinance. We had comments from uh, um, the uh, young ladies from uh, Audubon Society, et cetera, talking about, well, they're going to try and, and get some money in their, their uh, uh, budget to have a person to do some enforcing. Maybe the appropriating bodies, and in this town that would be you, maybe the appropriating bodies are putting too much money in thing, into things like coordinators of this or coordinators of that, and not enough money into which really going to have an effect. And that effect is going to be enforcing. Somebody's out there, they get whacked with a $100 fine that appears in the paper. You know what? Pretty soon, people are going to be obeying that ordinance. They're just going to. I don't want to get whacked with a hundred dollar fine. Would you? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and incidentally, I apologize for the cell phone before. <laughs> Unlike church, I didn't put it on uh, silent. I'm, I'm sorry. Hi, um, Sue Foley Ferguson, um, Council Roy. Just so you know, I am deaf in one ear, and I did not hear any beeping. So if you could just flag me down, I don't even. I will. Yeah, I seriously can't hear it. Um, I was a little bit confused because some t even if you pass a stop sign, um, if you're speeding or whatever, and you accidentally miss a stop sign, you sometimes get nicked. You sometimes get that $100 enforcement fine, even if it was an accident. And yet we know who did this to the plover, and we're not giving them a fine. Give them a fine. Feds, give them a fine. Count, Scarborough, give them a fine. It's an accident. I'm, no, I want to, but I think, you know, one of the things the statistics said in the Audubon report was for the third year in a row, we had no known nest or chick loss due to dogs at large. That should be noted. No, and so this is the first year in four years that they've had dog issues. We don't have the statistics. As you consider this change, you can also consider the enforcement. I think there were great ideas. Um, the, the first gentleman talked about identification of leash-free areas. I think that's off, awesome. I was the, unfortunately, or fortunately, I was the person who brought the piping plover ordinance to this town in 2001. I was the ordinance chair, and I designed the ordinance. Um, I say unfortunately in the sense that I had hoped there would be enforcement. Education, there, is, there has been quite a bit of education. I think we're doing really good at education. We do need more signage or whatever. But the enforcement has been lacking, and that's going to screw you up every single time. How many citations for dog owners have there been? That statistic should be known. You, you as counselors can ask for the police department to pull that information together, and I think you should. Who's been cited? Um, because I don't think 
even leash violations are cited. Oh, they might go up to them and say, the bicycle patrol guy might say, oh, you got to put your dog on a leash. But who's been cited? The $100 fine, the whatever. Um, I'm afraid that if you do too much, pretty soon we are going to be a Plum Island and you are going to have us closed off. I was, I studied biology from the University of Michigan. I consider myself a biologist, but there is a balance here. And I think we are blaming the dogs. So here's some statistics that I got from Maine Audubon, uh, if I can find them. Um, out of the 42 pairs uh, of all of the predation, two were pred predators by a house cat, one was a weasel, one was Merlin activity, there was a family of skunks, and zero dogs. But the dogs are getting blamed, and that's from the Audubon report. So I just think, you know, just like speeding, drinking and driving, and indeed guns, one person who makes a bad mistake doesn't mean, oh, slam it down on everybody else. Take away my guns. Take away my car. Don't let me have a beer down at my local pub. I think we really have to be careful. I am very appreciative of protecting endangered species. I studied them in college, and I, oh, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, and no one I don't think in this town would ever call me non-conservation oriented since I've um, been the leader, I think, in the town for conservation in the town. So, okay, thank you. Bye. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tracy Bellinger from South Portland. I'm one of the seasonal biologists for the piping clovers. I spoke with you uh, at a previous meeting. Uh, one thing about the statistics that she just mentioned, the cat, the weasel, the merlin, they're all from last year. And the information that we provide on the Maine Audubon's website are only facts. We don't provide assumptions or inferences. We don't, if, and a lot of times when these birds disappear, we don't actually know what happened to them. We can guess. Uh, people mention signage being an issue. Uh, I know in particular the nest that was at the end of Pine Point near the pier. At one point we put up oh, probably what some might consider an extreme amount of signs that said no dogs in this area. So they're all about 150 feet. Most of them were actually less than 150 feet from the nest itself. The next time we came back there were dog prints all over the place. So obviously a simple sign with a, that says no dogs isn't working. Uh, Another thing, the productivity rate mentioned, 1.9% this year. That's a great productivity rate for the state. Scarborough's productivity rate was 0.75 this year. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention, although if leash laws were put into effect on the beaches, um, I have a map, if anyone wants to see too, that actually shows 10 places in Scarborough, including the Scarborough River Wildlife Sanctuary, right off Pine Point Road, that does allow dogs off leash, and about a dozen more places in Cape Elizabeth. So there is still the possibility to have your dog off leash. They're not robbed of that opportunity. We just don't want them on the beaches off leash when piping plover are there. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Robert Rovner. I live at 4 King Street in Pine Point. I want to thank you, the council, and everybody in town for increasing my taxes 50% this year. And, and for give, uh, and would for you stick to the topic, please? I am, and for giving me, and giving me the opportunity to um, be able to protect the plovers with all the taxes that I'm paying to you folks. We moved here six years ago, and one of the reasons that we decided to buy the house because of the access to the beach and the ability for my little 15-pound shih tzu to be able to run and enjoy himself. It's beyond me that all the people here are not the problem, and yet there isn't one thing in the, your proposed ordinance that addresses the off-season people and anybody that's on the beach between 9 and 5. That's what really annoys the hell out of me. You folks have, have just missed it because those are the people who need to be enforced. We don't. We protect the beach. We help you folks out. You can't even keep the people that you hire to clean the beach from smoking on the job. There's no smoking on the beach. You'll see in my little note, I emailed it to you. Every morning, beer bottles, liquor bottles are piled up. 
I'm really annoyed I wasn't invited to the party. Because somebody's having a good time on the beach, and you folks aren't enforcing anything. Mr. Rovner, the accusations and things are really not necessary. You need to speak to the point about the ordinance and dogs on the beach and the piping plovers. It is not necessary well, to not belittle I'm, I'm, and to down, uh, degradate the council. I'm not degradating the council. Okay. What but I'm trying to you do need is to be elevate. Considerate. I'm I am being considerate. You're not being considerate of us. That's the problem. You want to call me out of order? Slap the gavel. That's fine. I will. If okay. You continue. But, but you folks are missing the whole big picture here. There's an opportunity for you to make money. This opportunity that's been presented to you about the dogs on the beach, you don't do anything between the hours of 9 and 5. When the people come per park at Herd Park, make them buy a pass, a beach pass. You can, you can have for $2, whatever you want to charge them. Pine Point Road, you're not enforcing any of the no parking things. Not even Mr. Rovner, I would gavel you out. We, you don't know these things for a fact, and we do well, not. Well, I do know these things need, for a you fact. Need to, I live you, there. You're not ticketing anybody. Mr. Rovner, please take your seat. Good evening, Madam Chair. My name is Ann Robinson. I'm a lifelong resident of Maine. I'm not a resident of Scarborough, and I didn't know, frankly, until the gentleman from Falmouth spoke that you would allow somebody from, who isn't from Scarborough to speak, but I appreciate that opportunity. Um, as I said, I am a lifelong resident of Maine, and a year ago I achieved my dream of um, having a place at the beach, and I have a place in Old Orchard but very close to the Scarborough line. And I just want to make two points. One is, you know, a gentleman earlier said that he wants his children to be able to see the piping plovers, you know, in future generations, and I appreciate that. But I want to add another perspective. I walk my dog every day on the beach, and there literally, honestly, literally, hasn't been one day when I've been on the beach with my dog, if there are children on the beach, that a child doesn't come up to me, usually with a parent, and say, can I play with your dog? Can I throw the ball to your dog? Can I pet your dog? And we do. We stop, and my dog patiently plays when he would rather that I hurl the ball, you know, well into the water with a chuck it. I mean, he'll sit there while some child throws the ball three feet, and we go at this for half an hour. And adults come up to me and tell me that they find it entertaining, you know, to watch the dog to play. And so the person who spoke earlier who said that, you know, they're part of our lifestyle in Maine, I think that's really true. And I also want to say we've talked a lot about the nature and habits of and habitats, but the nature and habits of, of the piping plovers. And well, let's talk about the nature of dogs. It is in their DNA to run and play and want to be in the water and to swim. And to deny them that, I think, would be cruel. I, mean, I just can't think of another word for it. And you know, it's also in their in their nature to save people's lives, to, to guide and, and aid the disabled to guard people and property. They do a lot for humankind, and this is one of the greatest joys that they have, and I would just ask you not to um, eliminate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> Larry Brunster in Hanson Road. Um, I think I heard you say at the very beginning of this presentation what appears to me is something that's putting you folks between a rock and a hard spot. You have all of us saying, don't change the ordinance, you have some federal bureaucrats telling you change the ordinance, so we're going to slap you with a heavy fine. And are we able to change that ordinance enough to make them happy? I don't. I don't know if I misheard, but I, I, I thought that I heard that kind of inference. But getting back to our ordinance, um, I would like to see a little bit more study done on where these plovers are nesting, and how many of them are actually nesting in Scarborough. Uh, as somebody stated on Higgins Beach, I can see the west or northern end of Higgins Beach, which is near the outlet of the Spurwink River, as being an area that, where they could nest. I think the rest of the place is under, underwater at high tide a good part of the year. Um, and uh, I, th I think Scarborough Beach is off limits to dogs all the time. I think it's kind of a, a sanctuary. We have an island that is a sanctuary off the coast of Scarborough. What's the public population doing out there? Has anybody gone out there to take a look? And how do, we, how do we know how many actual nests are, are nesting in Scarborough? I mean, we know about the four that they find. Are there 60 others that they're not finding? I mean, it's a, it's a big place. And they don't just nest. 
I don't know, maybe the, maybe maybe the East Coast ones do that just nest on beaches. I don't, I don't know. I can't speak to that. But another thing, uh, catch-22, is one gentleman wants you to have more trash cans on the beach, but as far as unkin foods, that, that's just convenience food for wild animals. And you're attracting wild animals to the beach. They're, they're, you've got one every 150 feet down the beach today. So when we leave at night, when all of us leave at night, all the little creepy crawly things come out, feed on that, and whatever else happens to be running around the beach. So, uh, you know, there has to be some room here for people, plovers, and dogs. And I, I, I hope we're, we're, we're able to compromise, although I'm fearful that we won't be able to compromise because getting off topic, there's a handicapped, accessible wharf built on the Spurwink River. When they built it, they denied a historic access to that river by clamors from the town of Scarborough. And that just shows me the intractability of federal bureaucrats when it comes to dealing with things like this. So you have your hands full. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Friends. Hi, my name is Carrie Brady, and I live at in Crossing Drive in Scarborough, which is close to Pine Point. And I just, I've never come to anything like this, but I really think it's important for people to realize I take my dog down there every morning. I don't see these successive abuses that go on. Um, if my dog's under voice control, if I see her take off, she comes back, I put a leash on her. I don't, it's too cold down there in the winter. This, I enjoy this time of year. I get up in the morning, I take my dog down there. Um, I, I don't know what the answer to this is, but I just felt like I think there's a lot of people here. Some of them aren't comfortable speaking. Personally, I'm not either. But I really feel that, like a lot of people, this really needs to be looked at a little more. It's not just the dog owners versus the bird people. Um, th there's a lot of things that, you know, the state laws, are we governed by them? I'm not really sure any of us got an answer to that. Does anyone know that? I mean, are we governed by I mean, are, are we going to just do it because we're going to get fined if we don't? That's that's not the impetus. No, I'm just asking, is that is that a is that what I just I guess is there an answer well, to that? It's a consideration that we have. It's to a consideration. I mean, I certainly, we represent all the citizens of the community. Right. Some love dogs and some don't, and there's a right. lot of issues. Right. There is. So, I guess that's the whole picture that maybe this needs to be. Maybe people are saying there does need to be like a subgroup of people to talk about this some more, since it seems to be such a sensitive issue. But thank you. Thank you, Gary. Hi, my name is Charlie Maynard, Pine Point Road, Scarborough. My big issue is the times you have. I'm an old... Don't handle the mic because it'll do static, thanks. I'm an old retired guy, and I go down the beach year-round, twice a day. And come to find out, I got to... Through the month of April and Mar uh, March, a April, May, June, I got to be off the beach by 9 o'clock. I get poor circulation, like a lot of old people have. If it's colder in hell, these people are going to work at eight or nine o'clock in the morning. That nine o'clock stuff is diddling to them. You know, they're they're not concerned about that time. The people that are concerned about that time is me and half a dozen other retired people in this room. We're getting screwed. It's just another way to screw the old timers. That's and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Charlie. Hi. <laughs> Joanne Grenier, 8080 East Grand Avenue, Scarborough. Um, we acquired a rescue dog about a year ago, a golden retriever, who simply loves the Pine Point Beach. Um, and as I was listening to uh, Councilwoman I, Ms. Holbrook, I believe you read the um, National Public Lands Day. I uh, can't help thinking, and I saw a couple of smiles amongst the counselors too, this is what you need to refer to when you are making your decisions about the ordinance, the use of public lands 
for recreation, for protection of the animals. It had so many wonderful points, all of which said we need to make sure we address them all, that we don't favor one group over the other. We find a way for all to be able to use the beach adequately. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Anyone else? Is there anybody else who has not spoken the first time before Mr. Reale speaks the second time? Okay. We have to allow everybody to speak for the first time before we get repeats. Um, I'm running out of time. I know. Yeah. I think we're done. Almost. My name's Gail DeRice, and I live at 105 Hardy Road in Falmouth. Uh, for the past five years, I've had the privilege thanks to all the taxpayers here in Scarborough to use the beach with my two dogs. Um, I'd like to think that I'm a responsible dog owner. I work hard at it. Um, we average twice a day, maybe three or four times a week. Um, it came to my mind that an opportunity exists for you folks to perhaps have a teaching moment here and um, I would be willing, as an outsider, to pay a license fee like we do for a fishing license and take a test that would indicate that I knew what the rules were for the beach and that I knew what the rules were for my dog. And um, I was aware of the plovers and any other endangered species. And then I could come and use the beach, and then the warden who patrols the beach could see me displaying my little badge or whatever, like a ski lift ticket. And um, he would know that I was someone who, was, um, who had taken the time and was responsible. And also, I would be generating money for the community, for your community, for you to hire the people to patrol the beach. And um, just as a little footnote, I do pick up tons of trash. And we are stewards. And, um, it's a community of us that enjoy each other's company in the morning, and our dogs enjoy the company of other dogs. And it really is a quality of life issue for these animals, as well as the plovers. And um, I didn't know there were plovers there. I did not know. And I park at the same place all the time, and um, I was thinking, wow, there should be a big sign here that instructs us about the plovers and has a picture of a plover. And, whatever else there might be there. And maybe it could be a learning or a teaching moment for everyone. So, you know, the Audubon people could move a little plover thing across the board and let us know where the plovers, I'm, I'm not making fun of it, really. I mean, let us know where the plovers are because the last thing I would want is for my dogs to hurt a plover. I mean, they're beautiful creatures. So I would be willing to pay money to be on the beach with my dog, and I would be willing to take a test. And that was my idea. So thank you. Is there anybody else who hasn't spoken once already? If, you, if anybody else wants to speak, if you could queue up down here because we're, we're pushing time. Um, take this gentleman and then Mr. Reale, and then we need to be on with... Uh, my name is <coughs> Robert D. Rice. I'm Gail's husband. I live in Falmouth. And I just wanted to say one thing. We're talking about leashes here as one solution. We have two dogs which are, have webbed feet. They're Portuguese water dogs. They come there to swim. You can't use a leash and have a dog swim. So just please get, take that into consideration when you start talking about just using leashes to control the dogs because that's going to preclude our dogs from really having any kind of fun at the beach. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Dominic. Thank you. I have a question. Is the nesting restricted to one small area, or is it or the whole uh, Scarborough beaches? The proposal would not uh, indicate specific areas. It is the beach entirely. So it's not a restricted area? Not at this point, no. Because oh, my thought was, if it was, we could actually fence it in so animals could not get into, dogs could not get into that area on both sides. But the birds need to get And if we, excuse me? The birds need to go to the shoreline. That's where they feed. So. Oh, you, we would space it out so they could get out. But if it's not in a restricted area, that's 
no, no, no sense of discussing it. Thank you. Can I make a comment on that? Um, I spoke with uh, the girl from uh, Audubon about that earlier, and there are nesting areas at the beaches, and that's where they are fenced in and all the signs are. Those are the nesting areas. Once the birds hatch, immediately they're off to the rest of the beach. So it's not just the nesting areas that have to be protected, it's the whole beach that has to be protected. Um, to Philly Ferguson, real quick, the one thing I forgot to mention, and I, I know we have a ton of, um, a ton of trails in this community where we can do dogs off leash, but I want to tell you something. I used to go every single solitary day to Camp Ketcha off leash dogs, and I didn't take them to the beach until all of my last three dogs tested positive for Lyme. And the last time we buried a dog, we must have had over 200 ticks on my daughter, who's 11 years old. So I want you to be aware that although there are the only time that I don't walk my dogs <laughs> in the trails is during the summer, unfortunately, because of the ticks. So that's a rock and a hard place as well. Um, I would go to the woods as well, and I would go on those. And I know that there's ticks in the grasses at the beach, but I don't go to the grasses at the beach. I go to the sand. So I want you to be aware that's a health issue for me and my daughter, my daughter, myself. I don't want to get Lyme's disease. So you got another thing to balance, okay? Thank you. Bye. There are fan fleas, though. <laughs> Okay, close public comment time, a motion from the council. And remember, as, as you hear this motion, this is the first reading. Okay, this is the first reading. And I, I would also, I wanted to give credence, we had multiple emails, and I don't have the names of, of many people, but certainly uh, recognize them. And when I got them, I forwarded them to other council members, and they, they did in turn to me. So um, many, many other people uh, had, did make comments. But anyway, this is the first reading. We have a two-week period of time before we have our next meeting for more input from the public, for more consideration and thought by the council, uh, and, uh, and then there will be more comment time before we do a second reading. There may be amendments. There may be changes. I don't know. But remember, it's the first reading tonight, so um, that's where we stand. So can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the ordinance as uh, provided by the Ordinance Committee. Second. Okay, the motion has been moved and seconded. Is there comments or questions? All right. I think maybe just um, I have a comment, Judy. Uh, it's a very multifaceted issue. Um, certainly I sympathize. Um, I've had dogs that are very much voice trained, would drop if I said drop, would lay down and play dead if I said play dead. And I've also had dogs that you cannot, under any circumstance, let off leash. Um, I certainly sympathize with all of you. Um, you know, my vote tonight, I'll probably vote um, in support of this tonight so that it could perpetuate more discussions. Um, I would hope, in light of everything, there was a lot of great and phenomenal ideas that have come out out of the last few days, um, certainly here tonight, certainly through some emails. Um, I would hope that you know, that that would be recepted. Well, you know, alternatives might be well received um, with the council as well as U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, there is also, again, multiple problems with this, though, um, and I guess it's more than just the leashes on the beach. Um, I had to, nature called, sorry, so I don't know if this was brought up, but there are certainly, um, as a great example, the leash law, our provision of approval for our dredge project is based on whether or not we pass a leash law. That's an important project. If we don't dredge the Scarborough River, we're going to have a serious issue with our marina. Um, so it is very much a rock and a hard place. Certainly I sympathize, certainly I feel my personal preferences. There should be certain times of the day for an hour or two in certain areas that you could take your dog. That might not be decision I can give to you, though. There, there are other bigger multiple things. But again, hopefully there's a lot of great ideas, there's a lot of community support, and I hope that um, something else could perhaps be achieved other than what's in front of us. Councilor Sullivan. Um, as the chair of the Ordinance Committee, 
Uh, I'd like to say that um, this task was brought forward by Councillor Alquist, asked, uh, tasked the uh, committee with uh, coming up with language. His uh, first, I think you all know, his first uh, comments were a ban of dogs on the beach, total ban during the plover season. However, after uh, talking and working through this, um, the um, choice was um, dogs on a leash. That seemed to be what would satisfy the government agencies. Since uh, we, we've worked on it, and that is uh, what we found was that was the common um, thing that we could agree on and that the um, anything else would be leaving the the uh, ordinance the way it is so uh, whether this passes or not in the end we were tasked with the job of coming up with a, uh, some sort of a solution uh, and this will, will be forwarded tonight as the first reading um, and as um, uh, Councillor Roy said, uh, there's two more weeks to maybe come up with some alternatives or um, something that may work. However, I'm not optimistic about it because as tonight, everybody in this room sat here and heard what the biologist uh, professionals, the people that are in charge of the laws, said tonight, what was acceptable to them. Everyone here heard it. That's the end of my comments. Sure. I just, yeah, I, none of this has, has, no one has taken this situation lightly. Um, this isn't something that we just sat down and said, well, okay, none of us like dogs. We're not going to let anybody bring their dogs to the beach. It's, it has this. So, like Council Holbrook said, it's so much more complex than that. Um, we take this seriously. We're we were elected, we're elected officials. Um, it's distressing to me the amount of negative, abrasive, I would almost say a couple of them could border on the line of bullyish um, emails that we've received. I would never approach someone um, in a confrontational way, whether we saw eye to eye or not, and I would hope that we would get the same sort of respect. I think that there's a way that people can come together even when they don't agree with each other and find solutions. And I think that that's what we're going to have to do with this. I mean, unfortunately, we're not going to make everybody happy. Um, some of us might not even be necessarily happy with um, what ends up coming about. But there's so many levels to this. It's, it's, when you start to look deeper at it, and I would encourage people to do that, um, to get the facts straight before you email a counselor. Um, it's, just, it's, it's been a frustrating process for me. And so I guess, I guess my point is that there is a very complicated process and we're, do, we're, we're trying. So I would ask for patience and it's first reading. One. That's disheartening too when you can't stick with us till the end of the meeting. Yeah. But I, was that, do you think it's something I said? <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. Oh, have that Richard, yeah. Yes, yeah, it is disheartening because we sat here for an hour and Two hours. I don't know, 20 minutes, an hour and 40 minutes to listen to everybody's, uh, what they had to say, but obviously they can't listen to what we have to say. Um, and I have to concur um, with uh, Councilor St. Clair. There was a lot of emails, a lot of disinformation that was totally wrong that was sent out there. But, uh, there's been plenty of people that have gotten riled up over facts that aren't true. Uh, I've been sent pictures of these uh, dogs off leash disturbing other people. I've been shown videos by people in the community of this. So I meant, and I'll say my emails are probably uh, 60, 40. Um, so 
there's a lot of people that didn't come tonight to speak that are in favor of dogs leashed on the beach. So, and just because, I mean, a lot of people have families. They're not able to get out at night. Um, so I understand that, and I take that into consideration. So, um, and I think there's been plenty of people that made some pretty good points on both sides tonight. However, we have to weigh the facts in the... Um, Outcome will uh, be decided at the next meeting. I just have one more quick thing, I promise. I just want to say, uh, on top of what I said about the emails, we're always encouraging of emails in general, or phone calls, or stopping us at the grocery store. Um, that's not the issue, so I don't, want, I don't want my message to be taken the wrong way. I, I love input. Um, even, like I said, even when we don't agree on an issue, I still love the communication of it because that's what we're here for, and we want to hear both sides of it. That's how we make the best decisions that we can for everyone. I just think there's a way to get things done in a positive way, and there's a way to get things done in a non-positive way. So, sorry, but that's it. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I'd just like to say uh, that this is pretty much just the beginning of the process. This is the first reading. Uh, we're going to have another meeting, another public hearing. Um, there's one thing that that we definitely will delve into, and that's the enforcement issue. I think we all understand uh, that enforcement hasn't taken place, um, and it's key. It's key to any ordinance. How we go about doing that, I don't know. That's something that we really have to figure out, but it's got to be a big part of the ordinance. Um, and hopefully uh, anything that we do come up up with uh, will have a, a very strong enforcement uh, portion associated with it so that we can go out. I know I, I live at Hickens Beach. Uh, I can go down to Hickens Beach at any time after 5 o'clock if the tide is low and half the dogs that are out there are not on leashes. Uh, and I also know that there are a ton of extremely responsible dog owners. I mean, there, there are two groups of people. Unfortunately, we can't have two different ordinances, one for the good guys, one for the bad guys. So we're, gonna have, we're trying to work through it. We're trying to do the best we can. We're trying to get input from the Audubon Society, from the Inland Fisheries Department, and we have to meld all this stuff together. And you just have to be patient with us. That's all i got to say. Yes, I pretty much uh -huh. concur with everybody. I think you know. Uh, I think the enforcement is the issue, but I think we can become innovative with the, with the resources that we have. We have one animal control officer. At any given time, on the roads in the town of Scarborough, there are four cruisers. One may be in booking somebody. 1978, when we only had 7,800 residents, at any given time there were three cruisers on the road. We now have almost 20,000 people. And we have four cruises on the road at any given time. So resources are not there, but I think we can become innovative in how we use the resources we have. We have some volunteer uh, people that do some volunteer work for the police department. We can vary times, days, and those kinds of things. Certainly, I think, you know, the time, uh, I think we have to pay attention to IFNW and to the feds, and we have to look at those months, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's what's, what's the best for, for the plovers, but we also have to think about what's best for the dogs as well. I think we need to go back and think about Hurricane Katrina and when those people were separated from their dogs. And they found out very, very hard, very, very well that dogs are part of our families and we cater to them and they have joys and pleasures in their lives. So let's not lose track of that. Uh, in, in the whole process, I think. Signage, certainly, I, I applaud uh, the Higgins Beach people. Glennis, with the, I'm anxious to do my, I'm, I'm going to put my, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, what is it called? Uh, That's the one, I don't even know what they're called. I'm too old for that stuff. Um, can you see a little old lady with sagging tattoos? No. Um, but, but I think the education that they've done down there, maybe you haven't ha you've gotten Fs, but I think eventually you'll get As. But I think if we can coordinate that effort for the other beaches and, and do some consistent signage in 
both all all the beaches we have. Let's take a look at what our signs actually say because we've put them up put them up at different times and maybe they're a little different. Maybe we can be more innovative with the signs. Uh, so there's lots of things. I, I I thank everybody who spoke tonight and I apologize for getting a little um, perturbed, um, but. Um, it was necessary that I that I demonstrate that we're not here to be beat upon. We're here to listen and to be helpful and to make educated and informed decisions. And we look to you, the people, to give us those thoughts and ideas. There's lots of things. The, the Black Point Park being maybe a dog area as an alternative with some area to swim. Those are things that we need to think of. Again, we have to think of budget, but we'll get there. Um, so I think there's a bunch of things that we need to work on. What can get us by for now? What will satisfy the the, the authorities that we have to, you know, be aware of? Uh, we can't just say bye. We don't want to see you again. Um, and and we can work on all of the other things. So we can tweak it a little bit. Um, there are more people, and because there's more people, there's more dogs, and that's part of life. Uh, again, I say I've been here 61 years, and. I kind of wish I could have put a gate around it 60 years ago. It'd be simpler, but that didn't happen. So we have to learn to uh, live together. And this lady here in the front who went back to the resolution, and I think it was the perfect timing for that resolution. And uh, I would encourage people to read it again. So um, again, I will probably vote in favor of this first reading tonight. However, there may be some amendments that will come forward the next time from myself or from others um, that will refine it, fine tune it, and hopefully come up with a happy compromise that we all can live with. We may not be happy with, but we can live with it. So, any other comments from Council at this point in time? All those in favor? Now we go to the plover ordinance. Now, do we have to go through the talks again? <laughs> or? Order number 1362 is the first reading and scheduled a public hearing on the proposed amendments to the Chapter 610, the Piping Plover Ordinance. And as a preface to that, it only addresses the exact same issues. So um, you can go from there. And, yeah. just, and just the dates. And we have exactly. to look at the length of leashes and all those good things. So, motion from the Council. Motion to approve. Thank <laughs> All those in favor? Thank you. Order number 1363 is the first reading and scheduled public hearing on the proposed amendments to, ch uh, to Chapter 1301, the General Assistance Ordinance pursuant to Title 22 of the Maine Revised Stat Statute, subsection 43054. As an explanation for that, um, the state is the one who um, uh, hands out the General Assistance Rules and Guidelines, and they say, here it is, this is what you will give for assistance to people who need assistance with housing food, uh, medical expenses, et cetera. This is how much we'll pay, um, but here it is, and you must ratify it in council chamber. And that's basically the, in a nutshell, um, we, have, we have to accept what they're offering us. So with that, any public comment? Hearing none, can I have a motion from the motion council? Motion to approve. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments from council? All those in favor, thank you. Order number 1364 is act on the request to certify the results of the school validation referendum election that was held on Tuesday, August 13, 2013. The results of which was 999 yeas, 472 nays. For a total of 1,471 total votes cast out of a little over 14,000 or 15,000 voters in the town of Scarborough, but it's what, 15% or 10%? 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 10%. 
Um, just that we have uh, appointments met this evening. Um, we have a name to post. We have Rachel Hendrickson for Parks and Conservation Land Board as a full voting member. And um, that'll be it for me for tonight. Okay, Councilor Sullivan. I have nothing to report on the Transportation Committee, and I think uh, we discussed a lot of the Ordinance Committee tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we haven't scheduled uh, another meeting. We're waiting. Jim's uh, gone to Florida um, for um, tests for a transplant, and Ronnie's away on, uh, for his work. So I'm not sure what the date will be. Um, I couldn't get... Um, Ronnie to narrow down what night in September or uh, when um, Jim will be back. So the uh, thing, the pressing issue for the ordinance committee is cell phone towers at the next meeting. That's uh, one that we have to get, <coughs> try to get through and um, get it somewhere into a working um, uh, language for the council. The vote on. And uh, that's it. Councillor St. Clair? I don't have any. Thank you. Councillor Blaze? None. Councillor Roy? Um, let's see. see we have that. Um, Finance Committee is going to be holding, um, well, we wanted two meetings a month in September and October, but because of some uh, other conflicts, we'll be having one meeting in September and three in October on Tuesdays, 8 a.m., Finance Committee. And these are preliminary meetings to the Finance Committee, uh, finance committee uh, meetings uh, at budget time. We're going to be sitting and just uh, brainstorming with the major departments in the, in the town about um, essential services and nice to do services and how can we look at that how can we do it different how can we do it better uh, can we eliminate some things um, and, and all in preparation for the fact that the department heads are going to be starting doing their budgets for 2014 come November um, so we wanted to really brainstorm some thoughts and ideas about how we can trim down the municipal at least component of the budget uh, by looking at the services that we provide and whether or not they're um, there are things that we can continue to do. Um, let's see, what other committee? Uh, Energy Committee met last week. I wasn't able to be there, but uh, Karen Martin and um, and I don't know who Julie, Julie's last name, but anyway, Karen Martin, who is the president uh, of uh, SEDCO, uh, met with the committee members that were there, and what they were looking at was the vision that SEDCO has for Scarborough and what the, what the SEDCO did was look at all the committees and all the committees work and say what do we want to see happening in the future to Scarborough relative to, and in this instance, energy, um, so that we could get our ducks all in a row so that we're not working against each other and we're all you know, heading for the same goalpost. Um, and the other thing is the TriGen um, project is still moving forward. Um, that was approved in the budget, and what we'll be doing, we'll be putting in a trigen model for heat, cooling, and electricity, electricity production. So, uh, so that, uh, that, that's exciting. Well, <coughs> and Long Range Planning Committee, uh, our next meeting is 13th of uh, September, but we did meet um, August, I think it was 8th or 6th, I think it was August 6th, uh, at, at which time we um, discuss the Crossroads District further uh, and the Gorham Road Development District, which is the golf course in the surrounding areas, talking about future and what, what could happen. Um, uh, we talked about cleaning up some zoning in the shoreline zoning areas, and uh, Dan's going to develop some uh, protocols to you know drive that might be driven by a particular request uh, for, like, for example, the Jensen property where we just approved... Uh, getting the zones uh, aligned properly. So, And then we'll be meeting again on the 13th with stormwater standards, yard standards, setbacks, um, and um, historic preservation review requirements. So I think that's all the committee's uh, manager's report. Yes, thank you. Uh, at your place this evening, I uh, provided you a memorandum from the town tax assessor. Uh, as of yesterday, he committed taxes for 2013, this is value as of 
April 1st of this year. Uh, the end result was uh, an increase to the total value of the town by over $28 million, and essentially that was a combination of some changes in residential values, uh, personal property value, and a more than $8 million increase in commercial values, all totaling that $28 million. The effect of, of that uh, puts the mill rate at $14.77 per thousand. Uh, that's down three cents from what we were projected at um, as of your last uh, approval of the budget. Uh, that represents a 7% increase, unfortunately, um, and translates to 97 cents in the tax rate. Um, he would love to have been he here. His daughter's getting married this weekend, and so uh, we thought it was best that I communicate this on his behalf. But if you wish, he's certainly pleased to appear before you at your next meeting. Uh, a couple of quick project updates. The Dunson project is, is done for all intents and purposes. Uh, there's some landscape issues that we're not pleased with, but I think they're going to let those go through the fall and we'll revisit that in the spring. Uh, there are some fine tuning that we're looking at um, with respect to the old Payne Road, the section that's been discontinued, if you will. Uh, there's some wayward traffic that thinks they're getting out to Route 1 and uh, find themselves in a parking lot. <laughs> so we're looking at some uh, low cost. Uh, simple solutions first with signage and paint to, to see if that would be effective. Uh, and failing that, uh, we, we may need to do some modifications to really encourage traffic to continue around the new section of Payne Road. But I think that will be something we do in the spring if that level of effort is necessary. And lastly, on the dredge project, as was mentioned um, earlier this evening, uh, just today I believe uh, Army Corps has the final clearance to move forward through the permit process. And in fact, they scheduled a pre-bid meeting for September 4th in the morning, and myself and staff will be participating in that um, in that pre-bid meeting. All of this points toward the dredge accomplish being accomplished this next window, which uh, starts mid-October, as I recall. Um, I would also just like to note that uh, this dredge project is limited to the federal channel. That's uh, Army Corps' uh, responsibility is for navigation purposes. Um, Councilor Sullivan left me a message earlier today. I know there are other areas um, inside, up, up the river, if you will, where there are boats that are on moorings that are affected by um, some of the accretion of sand right now as well. But this dredge project is limited to the Federal Channel on only. That's not to say we couldn't talk to the successful contractor and do additional work, but it would be at local expense. Right. With that, I'm certainly available for questions if you have any. Council <coughs> comments. Council St. Clair. <laughs> I, I probably said enough. <laughs> Thank you, though. Please. Uh, no comments. Councilor Holcroft. Uh, no, I don't have anything to say. I am also all set. This is one of our right. leaders tonight. I, unfortunately, as you know, much to Ron's dismay, yes, have some <laughs> comments. Um, First, I'd certainly like to say congratulations to Erica Justman, uh, who uh, came in the first uh, woman, American woman, Beach to Beacon. Maine. Scarborough. Huh? Is it American woman? Certainly a Maine woman. Yeah, she's Maine. And she's Scarborough. She lives oh, in Scarborough. I didn't realize she was the first American yeah. woman. Yes. That's good. <laughs> and then... She's hired. Let's get it straight. Huh? On the, she, she's American. I know she, she is. <laughs> okay. All right. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, certainly condolences go out to Kim and Carrie Corthell on the passing of their mother recently. Um, and then I have a bunch of other other folks who have passed away, and particularly most mostly today, Alfred Bell, um, 97 years old. Um, his wife Dorothy passed away in April, I believe. Um, and I could always count on Alfred to call me at budget time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you read his, if you read the write up from him today. Um, he he drove bus. And the girls got on the bus first, and the girls sat on one side of the bus, and the boys sat on the other. And that's the way it was. And anybody who misbehaved got to, uh, with their parents, come down and clean the bus on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of interesting. We'll so, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but just today. Um, but so there's a, there's a fairly long list from the, from the other from. The others that have passed away and certainly condolences go out to their family. Some of them are residents of Maine Veterans Home, but then they are residents of Scarborough, George Dunn, George Haskell, and Doc Harris. 
and then the other folks, um, Dorothy Benson. She was born and brought up in Scarborough, graduated from Scarborough High School, but lived, I think, out in Falmouth. Um, Ashley Drew, who was a young gal, graduated from Scarborough High School, I think, in 2009, mm -hmm. around there. Um, John uh, Stebbins, um, uh, Alameda Urquhart, and uh, there used to be a business called Urquhart's, and they sold uh, propane and everything, and she was our Boston cane holder, and she was 100. 100. She had just turned 100. Uh, Jerome Simpson, uh, Amy Pearson, uh, Virginia Gooch, Russell Landolt, um, Gregory Rowe, although not a resident of Scarborough, was a resident because he was at Beach Ridge most of the time, the fellow, young fellow that was uh, uh, killed uh, at Beach Ridge. Pamela Storer, Marie Lampron, um, she was at Maine Vets. Raymond Anderson was also at Maine Vets, and Charlie Small was at Maine Vets. So, uh, other than that, um, I certainly would thank all of you uh, who participated tonight um, and all of the comments. Certainly you saw me taking notes and others taking notes. Uh, and so we've got a lot of soul searching and we've got a lot of work to do between now and two weeks hence. Um, and we certainly will do our job uh, and try to come up with what we can to meet the needs of, as best possible of everybody involved. Um, with that, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Thank you.